Okay, let me record. All right, uh, welcome committee members, liaisons, and members of the public to the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission meeting. Thank you for joining us. We are using Zoom with the goal to foster a more inclusive environment and effective meeting. If you would like to comment during the meeting, please type I have a comment or I have a question in the chat box and a message will be sent to the host. Alternatively, you can also use the raise hand feature. In efforts of transparency for all those joining this public meeting, whether by phone or Zoom, we request that you refrain from having side conversations on chat about the content of the meeting. Again, the chat feature is utilized simply as a tool for you to virtually indicate that you would like to speak in order to help the chair facilitate the discussion. A uh, reminder that going forward this year, all Legal Services Trust Fund Commission and committee meetings will be recorded and posted to the State Bar website. Uh, and also another reminder that this is a video conference and to please be aware of your surroundings behind you. If you uh, are using your phone to dial into this meeting, please be sure your computer's microphone is on mute to avoid any audio feedback issues. And lastly, while joining audio via computer is highly recommended, if an individual loses audio, they can call in separately using the Zoom conference number. Thank you, Vicki. Uh, so I'm not sure if we have quorum yet, but can we do a roll call? Um, there, there are some people in the, um, the waiting room. Vicki, if you don't mind elevating all the commissioners. Yeah, they're getting in there. Okay. Eric, would you like me to start roll call? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, Badashe Aglagi? Yes, here. Great, you made it in. <laughs> Eric Iskin? Uh, present. Amin al -Saraf? Uh, He's joining, uh, or I'm just transferring him over, but he's okay. here. He's here, okay, great. Present. Thank Hi. you. Jeff Ball? I'm here. Kim Bartleson? Kim Bartleson? Uh, Kim Bartleson isn't attending today. She's not attending. Okay, she was on the RSP. Okay, so she's not attending. Okay, let me move over here so I'm not having a glare. Then... Louise Bayless, Fightmaster? Louise, are you on? Pamela Bennett? Here. Catherine Blakemore? Here. Will Bashelli? Prison. Erica Connolly? Here. Herman Dubois? Here. Rebecca Delfino? Here. Corey Friedman? Corey, are you on yet? Zahira Mann? Here. Jim Meeker? Here. Deborah Myers? Here. Bob Plantel? Here. Rich Rhinus? Here. Kim Savage? Here. Chris Schreiber? Here. Christina Venerelli? Here. Judge Jaskel? Here. Justice Murray? Oh, you know, you know he jumped off. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Judge Seligman? Here. Let me just do a quick count, Eric. I've got 20. Juan, I'm here. I, I got on before I was after I was called. It's Corey. Corey, okay, hold on. Thank you. Chris, do you have 19 voting members plus, so 21 to, to, all together, but 19 voting members? Um, I have 21 all together, uh, 18 voting members. I just don't have Kim. Oh, you or... added, did you add Corey? Because I Corey was the 19. Oh, and Corey, thank you, 19. Okay. Okay, so we, we have quorum. Um, Eric, may I take um, roll call for the rest of the staff? Yes, please, thank you. Oh, I'll do the liaisons first. Um, Selena Copeland? Present. Bonnie Huff? Here, thank you. 
Christine going on. Now State Bar staff, Andrea Fatanides. Andrea, are you on yet? Here. Okay, great. Crystal Bonding. Here. Erica Carroll. Here. Brady Dewar. Here. Christine Holmes. Here. Elizabeth Hom. Here. Dan Passamenek. Here. Are there any other um, liaisons or state bar staff that I missed? Uh, Judy, Carolina. Uh, Judy. Great. And uh, Carolina. Okay. Hi, Carolina. Great. Are there any members of the public who would like to introduce yourself at this time? Okay, great. I'll hand it back over to you, Eric. Okay, thanks, Dwan. So again, everyone, good afternoon. I'm Eric Iskin. I'm one of the co-chairs of the commission and we'll be chairing the meeting today. I did want to announce that uh, the Board of Trustees met on November 19th and formally approved Jeff Ball's nomination to the commission. So Jeff, thank you, congratulations, welcome. And the board also approved the uh, expansion of officer positions, our XCOM, naming me as a co-chair along with Bonifche and Rich Rhinus and Kim Savage as co-vice chairs. So we have, a, we have a heavy agenda today. Well, let's move on to the consent agenda first, um, where we have the uh, approval of the uh, action summary for our November 13th, 2020 meeting. Any comment or discussion on that? I had a question. Sure. Um, just on, on page three, where covered the uh, homeless prevention grants, I was clear as to, um, the 31 million coming or belonging to the homeless prevention grants. But the totals, I was, my question is, what totals are the 50,000, uh, 7 million and 40 million coming from? You kind of just kind of plugged in the, the numbers there, but I wasn't sure where they, where they came from, where they originated from. Do we have access to that page three? I don't have immediate access to it, so I'm not quite sure what um, you're talking about, Pam. I, name the, I put a page number on there. Um, I'm on their card. We're, we're looking it up, Pam. Okay. All right, I'm trying to pull up um, so that everyone can share my screen. Okay. Okay, I found it. Let me share my screen. Okay. <clears throat> um, do you see this the November 13 meeting? And we do, yes, we do. Pamela, what page are you re referencing? Um, go down. I, I had to name them myself. So number item number um, right there, item number eight. Okay. A. Just the uh, 31 million. <coughs> Excuse me. We, um, we know that that belongs to the homeless prevention. Yes, yes. But the other dollar amounts that were referenced in the text there, what did, where do those totals belong to? Oh, the this, fourth paragraph. Th this is this is part of the thirty-one million. So, okay. um, it's just saying that um, the, of this um, twenty-five percent, approximately um, seven point something million, is going out through the discretionary grants process. Okay, but then you have the forty is higher than the thirty-one, so that's why I was asking where did that. Um, that was the um, total uh, for requests received. It exceeded um, 39 oh, okay. million. Perfect. Um, with 39 um, okay. proposals. Thanks. Okay. So, was that clear enough, Pam? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Do we have a motion to any, any more discussion on that item? Motion to approve that action summary. I make a motion to approve the minutes from. Uh, Second. <laughs> from Friday, November thirteenth. <laughs> Pamela moved. Chris and Bob yeah. will second. And um, Eric, I'll do roll call vote. Yes, please. Bonashe. Yes. Eric. Yes. Amin. Yes. 
Jeff. Abstain. <clears throat> Kim Bartleson. Luis. Pamela. Yes. Catherine. Yes. Will. Yes. Erica. Yes. Herman. Yes. Rebecca. Yes. Corey. Yes. Zahira. Yes. Jim. Yes. Deborah. Yes. Bob. Yes. Rich. Yes. Rich? Oh, thank you. Kim Savage. Yes. Chris. Yes. Christina. Yes. I have 18. Duan, sorry, Duan, uh, just a uh, housekeeping. Uh, I noticed, thanks to Pam's question, that we jumped from Roman numeral seven to Roman numeral 10 on the following page. I wonder what happened to eight and nine. Oh, sorry, I have to open it up. And <laughs> then we took things out of order that particular day. Ah, that is true. Yeah. That is that Chris, Chris and Christine, can you, Chris, I think you're, the, I can't recall who took notes. Can someone speak to that quickly or I can look it up again? It was Dan. Oh, I sorry. Took the notes <laughs> and yes, uh, several items were taken out of order uh, because people had scheduling conflicts. Mm -hmm. So those will probably appear up at the top of the uh, minutes. And then um, otherwise, they appear as they did in the agenda. Rich, does that satisfy your question? Yeah, that satisfies the question. Okay, great. So I have 18. Chris, um, in our office, uh, do, is that, do you have 18? Uh, yes, uh, 18, yes, one abstention. Okay, great. Uh, motion passes, Eric. Okay, thank you. So we have a heavy ad agenda today. A lot of the items uh, here are, I don't want to foreclose discussion, but they will likely be fairly straightforward reviews of, uh, of committee actions uh, uh, on addressing various subjects. But um, I understand that we have state bar staff here uh, from our research group uh, to help us discuss item 6D on the agenda. Is that right, Duan? Yes, um, we have Ron Pai from um, the Office of um, Research and Institutional Accountability, ARIA, who helped with the um, analysis for this IELTA statutory change. Um, so if, if it's possible, uh, we'd like to move that agenda item so that um, Ron can um, be, uh, can help us at the front. Yeah, end. and I would say that that's one of the heavier uh, discussion items on the agenda. So why don't we move right to item 6D? Great. I'll let you take and, the lead on that, Juan, or and, whoever um, wants to do it. So Erica, Amin, and I have a PowerPoint presentation, and then um, Ron is going to help us uh, walk through some of the analysis. So let me share my screen. Um, so as you recall from the last um, commission meeting, um, the rules committee uh, met um, a, a few months ago uh, to, to look at some of the, the issues that's uh, uh, in the work plan. Um, as you recall, they decided to rework the work plan um, to uh, delve into some of the foundational issues um, while we move through um, some of the more technical issues later. So two of the issues that were up before that meeting um, was um, a primary purpose and how do you how do you um, define primary purpose for qualified legal services project and the other big issue for that meeting um, was indigency um, and whether we can provide some clarification in how um, programs um, account um, uh, income for their clients. Um, so part of that rules revision process is um, staff and the working group members come up with um, uh, tentative recommendations that we then circulate um, to the legal aid community um, through um, Selena and the legal aid 
Aid Association of California during that circulation of those preliminary recommendations related to indigency, um, the rules committee received feedback from the legal aid community that perhaps this might be a time that um, the commission and the state bar would consider um, advocating for a statutory change to raise the, the income, a client income threshold. Um, so this came out, this request came out from the rules committee um, and it's, it's coming from the community. Um, and based on that, um, you staff did some preliminary um, analysis. Um, we spoke to executive staff um, and, and there seemed to be some alignment in terms of um, wanting to move forward um, with the statutory change. Um, before we moved forward the statutory change though, um, uh, at the recommendation of uh, a staff um, to uh, the rules committee, uh, we wanted to do a bit of further analysis to see um, you know, what, what were the options that um, we could propose to the community to kind of solicit more formal feedback and um, what would be the implications of such a change. Um, when the when the um, Liwa A community um, provided us feedback in terms of wanting to do a statutory change, um, they didn't contemplate whether um, there would be um, a corollary um, change to the funding formula. Um, and so that that is an option that we um, also considered at the staff level and the rules committee uh, to see if there should be a change to the funding formula. You and if so, too? Do you want, okay, go find your package of, of your tree. And, and if so, uh, what would be the impact of that? Um, so as you uh, heard from the last commission meeting, um, staff, uh, we went back and we did some further analysis and we're going to be presenting um, that further analysis um, for, for your review today. So, so just a little bit of background. I, I'm going to spend a few minutes just reminding everybody what the current um, client income eligibility, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, the statutory requirements are, um, how that kind of interplays with qualified expenditures and our um, funding formula. Um, I'm going to then turn it over to Erica, who's going to provide um, a, a recap of the uh, legal aid community feedback, and then we're going to um, turn it over to Ron Pai from our Araya office, um, who um, Araya has been really um, working very hard the last few weeks um, to pull together the analysis um, that we'll be sharing with both the commission and, and the community later this week. And then um, we'll regroup to talk about next steps. Um, so let me just fast forward a little bit. Um, so we'll talk about um, kind of, again, the client eligibility and how the interfaces with qualified expenditures and county, um, of county funding allocations. Um, so just as a reminder, um, the Business and Professions Code is what um, governs um, what, what um, client eligibility income threshold um, programs that um, are eligible for IOLTA funding um, may use. So under Business and Professions Code um, 6213D, they outline um, several categories of indigency. Um, there's an income um, a threshold um, as one of, uh, of the categories of indigency. So, um, and this is the one that primarily gets used by, by our Qualified Legal Services Project. So if a client comes through the door and they fall below 125% of the federal poverty level, then they're qualified. There are a, a few other um, non-income qualifying categories, such as if you're a senior, then, then you qualify for services. And if you're a person with a developmental disability, you also qualify for services. Or if you're a person that receives SSI, um, then you're presumptively qualified too. But the, the main, um, uh, the, the uh, most clients come through the door because of the, the income threshold of 125% um, federal poverty threshold. So just, just and, and Erica has a slide that will um, kind of uh, compare um, 125 to 200 to um, AMI, and she'll talk a little bit more about that later. But just to give you um, a really high level, a family four um, at 125 is, is about um, 32, um, about $33,000 a year. So we're talking about um, really low, um, you know, very high needs um, client. Um, the statute, um, just a reminder, was created in the early 80s and it has not been um, revised, uh, at least in terms of client indigency um, since then. So uh, a lot of funders have moved to a higher income standard over the years. The most notable one is the Legal Services Corporation. Uh, which we fund all 11 LSC programs in California. They are generally our largest programs. Um, they serve um, millions of clients um, and they're at the 200% of federal poverty threshold. There are other funders um, that, that use different um, poverty threshold, but much higher than our 125. So for, for many years now, um, there has been kind of discussion um, among, in the community um, to raise the income threshold. There's been um, discussion um, with um, uh, state bar staff executive management um, to raise the income threshold, but there seems to have 
have not been alignment until this year um, from all the various um, stakeholders to move forward with a, with a change. So, you know, um, the rules committee and, and staff supports kind of investigating whether that that should um, whether we should make a push um, in conjunction with LAC, um, just because we haven't had a moment where we've had this this type of alignment. And, and we think, you know, as staff and the rules committee um, that that this 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 is a good opportunity given um, everything that's happening um, with with COVID-19 and kind of the, the inner impacts of the pandemic that providing kind of programs with more flexibility, uh, this could be kind of a good opportunity for us to uh, provide this this, this flexibility um, for, for programs and have this kind of positive change in the community. Um, so just also as a reminder to you um, why um, the income threshold is, is not only does it allow um, programs to use a higher income threshold, but it really gets into how um, their award allocation is determined. Um, so, you know, programs that qualify for our funding are not prohibited from um, using a higher income threshold. And in fact, there are many programs that have um, uh, requirements that are above the 125. Um, LSC is, is the prime example. Um, but what is prohibited is using our funding um, to serve anybody um, above 125, um, unless they're in the other kind of non um, uh, 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 categories of agency that's laid out by the statute. So if we were to raise the 125% up to some other level, um, we would allow programs to utilize our grant source to, 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 um, to serve those clients. And if you'll recall, the way our grant awards are allocated is based on qualified expenditures from the previous years. So um, if programs are able to use our funding um, uh, to, for our to 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 serve those uh, clients that are higher income threshold, or even if they don't use our funding, um, they can count those expenditures as qualifying, and and the and their award amount um, may be larger um, when we go to count um, award allocations. And why this is really important um, to think about um, is because of the funding formula. So right now, the funding formula um, runs in parity um, with the income eligibility um, threshold. So the income eligibility threshold is at 125% of the federal poverty threshold. The funding formula is also at 125% of the, of, of the federal threshold. So how the funding formula works <laughs> is that um, every year um, our office um, takes, um, the, uh, based on um, the American Community Survey data and to see how many people in a particular county are at or below 125% of the federal poverty threshold. Um, each county gets a pro rata share based on how many people are at 125% of the federal poverty threshold based on that 125. And then programs uh, apply um, on a, a, a bi-county basis and receive a pro rata share um, based on the number of qualified expenditures in that particular county that they spent on, on qualifying clients. So they, the, the, the client eligibility threshold and the funding formula kind of run in tandem with each other and they mirror each other. So one of the big questions that was not contemplated um, by the community, we believe, um, and in fact, even by staff until it was brought up at the rules committee and at the commission level was if we go to increase the income um, eligibility threshold, should we increase um, the funding formula so that they, they mirror each other? So, the, so that we do have some analysis on that um, to, to help with, with, with that discussion. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Erica to provide um, uh, the recap of the Leeway community feedback. Thanks, Dawn. Um, so as Dawn mentioned, um, when this first came up in the codification process and with the rules committee, uh, the working group had circulated a memorandum to um, the legal services community through the Legal Aid Association of California, um, proposing to clarify the uh, statutory definition of indigent person. And um, in response to that, the Legal Aid Association of California organized a, a call with its members um, to obtain that feedback. And uh, what arose out of it those discussions was, um, as Dwan mentioned, uh, a clear request to reconsider the um, income eligibility threshold. Um, in lax comments, um, broadly, uh, programs felt that the federal poverty level um, was just too low um, to use in a state like California, which uh, it doesn't account for the high cost of living in the state. Um, there were also comments related to uh, the fact that, as Dwan mentioned, other funds use higher thresholds, um, like the Legal Services Corporation can allow up to 200% of the federal poverty level um, based on certain income exceptions. And um, 
the Department of Housing and Urban Development uses area median income. So um, given that this is one of the lowest um, income eligibility thresholds, uh, programs felt that there was little to no flexibility when, when they found uh, compelling cases that they would like to use their IELTS or EAF funds for, but couldn't um, because the client simply just didn't meet that standard. So um, they, they had proposed, had proposed um, um, a few alternatives, alternatives one, being one being a statutory, a statutory change. change. Erica, um, a little bit of an echo. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no. I think that's better now. Okay. Um, so one of the alternatives proposed was uh, a, a statutory change to 200% of the federal poverty level um, or use of area median income. Um, or in the alternative, uh, if not pursuing a statutory change to allow for more liberal income exceptions. So for example, the Legal Services Corporation um, can take it when, when they're looking at income eligibility, they'll take into account um, fixed debt obligations, variations in income based on seasonal employment and the like. Um, and so that would fall under uh, that category. Uh, Erica, um, can, I, can I interrupt you for a second? I'm seeing yeah. some questions in the chat from, uh, from Pam. Do you want to, Pamela, do you want to ask any of your questions at this point? Uh, I'll ask if you will, we'll just keep those, um, you can have them as, as part of the record. Um, so I'll just ask a few of the questions um, that are there. Um, and the beginning of it says, if the sole purpose uh, is based on the pandemic, would this change be permanent or would be a temporary solution for two to three years? That was. And, 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 and it wouldn't be just because of the pandemic, but the pandemic is, is one of the reasons. I wouldn't even say the primary reason, but, but a helpful kind of reason. Um, and, and, and if it's a statutory change and it took effect, then it, it would be permanent until, there, until the legislation was changed again. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and what was wondering what 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 are considered some of the um, liberal income exceptions? Is there a specific list that everyone's looking at? Um, uh, no, I mean um, the Legal Services Corporation is one example. They use income exceptions, so like I was saying, taking into account fixed debt obligations, seasonal mm -hmm. income. Um, anything that would impact a person's ability to access legal services, not just based solely on strictly looking at income that mm -hmm. um, sort of the available funds that they would have to, to use um, if and when they needed legal services. So Legal Services Corporation does have a, a list that they use, um, but we haven't created one um, and that wasn't, there wasn't an explicit um, or mm -hmm. um, detailed list provided by the community in regards to that suggestion. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Okay. Um, so my, my other my other question kind of piggybacked on that what would the demographic or the population or clientele look like if they were if liberal income exceptions were allowed. So um, you can continue on. It'll, it'll, I'm sure you'll cover it in your presentation. Okay. Yeah. Um, and um, so basically the, the outcome of the Legal Aid Association of California's um, convenings uh, when they submitted their written comments was that there, there appeared to be consensus around increasing the income eligibility threshold, but that there was not um, a, a clear opinion on on what level or what measure to use um, when deciding to pursue an increase at this point. Um, and I know Selena, I think I saw in the chat that mm -hmm. she um, may have some comments related to um, lax uh, meetings and uh, the commentary that was provided. Yeah, let's, let's do that now. Selena, do you wanna add anything? Sure, and I think it's pretty brief too. And I think it also answers a little bit of Pamela's question about what's the reason. You know, our community has been talking about the need to increase the income eligibility threshold for, you know, as long as I've been in legal aid. So for more than a decade, 
um, because of the reasons that Duan mentioned earlier is that so many other sources of revenue and so many sources of grants and government contracts use a higher threshold. So the 125% of poverty is just simply out of date at this point of time. That is way too low of a threshold for the types of folks who really, um, I, I think should be eligible for legal aid. And in fact, they are el eligible for legal aid with other sources of funding. Um, so I think that this proposal of increasing the threshold actually mirrors what other foundations are doing, other, other government contractors are doing, you know, what we're doing with the Shriver grants. And I think it actually makes a lot of sense for a long-term change. But I, th I think the pandemic has made it really clear that this is an urgent issue and it's no longer a slow burn simmer. Um, a lot of folks are newly living in poverty or living right at the threshold of poverty that they never thought it would happen to them. And, and I think a lot of them may be going to legal aid to say, I'm, I'm about to get evicted, what do I do? And um, they probably think that they are eligible and they may, may be eligible for other sources of the funding, but not right now for, for IOLTA. And so I think this just really is responsive to the current pandemic, but also addresses a long-term problem of the eligibility threshold. And um, I, you know, when we convene folks to find out, you know, would you like to increase it? We didn't get a final answer at that time because we were trying to get consensus around, does this feel right based on the clients who are already coming to your door and the, and the new influx of clients based on the pandemic? And, you know, unilaterally everyone agreed that, that it was seemed appropriate to increase the threshold and LAC will reconvene our community in January to find out if we can get clear consensus around an amount. Um, I know that Erica's gonna cover this in, in just a moment, but um, I think it's really important that the community be united in what threshold makes the most sense for their client community and what makes the most sense in terms of staff staffing and just um, this source of, of um, of funding that can help people who are lower income and in crisis. And so we don't wanna to come to the legislature with disagreement about what would make sense. Cause I think the legislature would say, fine, if you're gonna, if you're gonna fight, like don't, don't fight with us, come back to us some other time. So we will get consensus, consensus around an amount before we go to the legislature. And, and that's, Oh. And, and Eric is going to talk about this later um, when we talk about next steps. Um, so I'm jumping on a little bit, but that's why we're hoping to solicit um, formal feedback from um, the community through a survey, which we can then say um, to the board of trustees that there is for, there is consensus, and we've done the analysis, and you know we've shared the analysis with the community, and they they understand the implications. Um, but we're trying to coordinate those efforts with Selena. So oh, Zahira, you had a comment. Thank you. Thank you so much, and. Um, Thank you for all the information and for this uh, great conversation. Um, my, my comment or question kind of has to do with um, like any analysis of, of like, and I don't, I don't think that this is necessarily something that um, state bar staff can do because it would be, it's a little in the weeds ultimately. Um, but one of the things that, um, that I'm a little bit concerned of having, looked at this, but then also some of the other um, allocations that we've been doing under, under other areas is what it means in terms of the, the grants received by individual organizations. Um, because the pot of money doesn't increase, what seems like it would increase are potential allocations to different organizations. And if the larger organizations can show that they serve more of these people, and the smaller organizations can't, then it seems as if what we'd be doing is shifting money from the smaller organizations to the larger organizations. And when we get to another item on the agenda, um, I have a question about how we do some of the uh, proposal review because it seems to weigh in favor of larger organizations. So I just wonder like, if we have various funding opportunities that um, way in favor of larger organizations if we are able to fund those entities that are not eligible, they're not able to get the federal funding and they're not able to get funding from private funders, they're really relying on this resource in a different way than some of the larger legal aid organizations. Um, so that's my, my question comment <laughs> because I, I do realize it's something that it's really hard for, um, virtually impossible for state bar staff to get at, but um, that would be my concern. And, and, and that's an excellent point, Zahira, and that is something that we've talked at at the staff level to try to do some analysis to present you some data around that, but it, it's, it's very difficult because we don't have the numbers from our programs of how many clients they serve, say, at 200 or at an AMI level of 80%, so that then we can run and, and, and see what an allocation could potentially look like. You'll, we ran the allocation based on 200%, um, but you could see it at the county level. We, don't, we can't run it, drill it down to the um, individual program level, 
just because we don't have that data at our fingertips. So that is definitely a limitation. And that, that is something that you're, what you raise is something that um, Erica and I do plan um, to make very clear to, to the community that this is perhaps an implication. Um, and, and you know, they, they need to think about what the shifts would, would look like um, and whether with, with those, would they still support a change? But, but that, 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 that is, uh, it's an excellent point. Yeah, I think it's safe to say that um, making any of these changes would impact um, allocations to various organizations, but there's a lot of moving pieces it, because in addition to um, whether certain organizations are serving um, higher income populations, uh, if the eligibility threshold were raised, it may also open up, open up the opportunity for more organizations um, to become eligible for this funding. And so then that might shift funding um, away from certain organizations as well um, and impact the their share essentially um, in a particular counties of um, services provided. So um, yes, as Dawn said, I um, agree. That's a great point, um, unfortunately. And as you acknowledged already, we, we don't have that information um, at our fingertips, it's probably something that we um, could anticipate, but don't have the specific data. And I think that Will and maybe somebody else had a question. Yeah. Uh, Will, go ahead. Sure, thank you. And I am obviously supportive of this uh, effort. I think um, the bottom line of having the ability for people who are at 200% FPL to come in and get the assistance they need is, is really valuable and, and improves the access. Um, my question was about the tying the allocation to federal poverty level or the AMI. It seems like the cost of living in California is gonna to continue to push the FPL out of alignment is there any other metric that might have long-term durability in the state of California, or is that a pipe dream? We looked at, and and you know, perhaps I can make a suggestion because we, um, if we can get through the slides and maybe behold the the of the questions at the end, because some of them may be answered. Because um, Erica and the Raya team did look into um, cost of living, um, and and we'll we'll let you know when we get there uh, why that that's actually not a viable option for us. Um, Absolutely. Sorry, I didn't realize we had no, 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 no. I would have held it. Thank you. No, no. Okay. Would that be okay, Eric, if we can try to get yeah, yeah. Please, okay. please. Yeah. Um, I think, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay. Yes. Um, so after receiving uh, feedback from the legal services community, as we've discussed, the rules committee um, reviewed that and had a discussion and um, the outcome of that was to, there was agreement to investigate a uh, possible change to the statutory threshold um, and uh, staff was requested to review various alternatives um, and uh, several members of the committee had already brought up concerns about um, unintended consequences for rural and or high poverty areas. Um, so um, what also came out of that discussion, which as Dawn mentioned was not necessarily, I think, um, brought to the fore by the legal services community, but the fact uh, that funding formula essentially runs um, parallel or in tandem with the um, the income eligibility threshold and whether um, those two statutes should both be changed if any change is pursued or if um, they could um, be bifurcated. So um, that's also something that staff agreed to look into. And there was a request for a formal survey um, of grantee preferences, um, given the feedback uh, that we received from LAC. So um, after uh, doing the research and, and getting um, some more information about the possible impacts of making any particular change to then provide that information to the community and see um, if any um, of their preferences had changed in light of that information. So. That is something, um, I'll get into that a little bit more later, but that is some, um, one of the next steps that we're pursuing uh, that will be providing that information to the community this week. And um, yeah, thank you. Um, so one of, one of the considerations um, that we've been discussing was 200% of the federal poverty level. Um, the income threshold, if using that measure um, would bring 
uh, an annual income up to 52,400 per year, um, as opposed to 32,750 under the current measure for a family of four. Um, what we found was that by making a change uh, to 200% of the federal poverty level, that would increase the eligible population throughout the state by over 5 million people. Um, I believe it's about 4 million in um, urban counties or urban rural counties, and then um, it would be a little, a little over 1 million um, in more rural areas. Um, and it would also potentially expand the number of organizations that would be eligible for funding. Um, so more organizations may uh, qualify to receive allocations of IL-10 EAF funds. Um, if using 200% of the federal poverty level for the funding formula, the, the formula itself would remain unchanged. Um, it would follow the same uh, formula that we currently use. Um, we would be able to obtain data um, at the county level using the American Community Survey five-year average as we do um, currently for 125% of the federal poverty level. And uh, Ron will get into this uh, more, but broadly, uh, one of the effects is that money would move away from more rural areas um, and into urban areas in the aggregate. Um, but if you look at the individual county level, the, the picture is a little bit less clear on that point. Um, so some of the implications if changing to 200% of the federal poverty level or that it would, would provide uh, grant recipients with the flexibility that they desire when um, deciding uh, how they can provide services um, and who they can serve. And it would be the easiest option from the state bar's point of view administratively um, because it would fit into um, our current funding formula. Um, but one of the cons is that it would uh, have the potential to move funding away from um, already impoverished areas. So that is um, an overview. I think Ron can uh, provide more information on um, the research that Araya conducted and um, the analysis that they have uh, about particularly what impact it would have if we change the funding formula to 200% of the federal poverty level. Or should we switch to Ron? <clears throat> Ron, and I have Ron's slides, um, so I can run them for you, Ron. Okay. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes. Okay. So what we were asked to do initially involved several elements of the proposed uh, changes considered being considered here. And what I'm presenting is focused on one specific element uh, in the proposal, which is to look at the potential impact of funding formula change from 125 to 200 uh, for federal poverty level on the allocation uh, of the funding across 58 counties. The first chart is using one of the two ways of measuring the change, um, changing in terms of the percent um, impact on individual counties. And the other way later on I'll get to is to look at the um, dollar impact across all 58 counties. And it's different a little bit, but overall, um, at the end, you would see um, there are clear patterns, but then the overall impact is rather uh, limited. So the first view, looking at the percent change, which is relative uh, between the two levels in the fund funding formula, um, on the vertical axis, you see the distribution of the percent change. Uh, the red line uh, indicates whether a county um, situated above or below will gain or lose funding as a result of funding formula change. So the highest percent change ranging from Mono County, uh, nearly 30% to, to at the lowest level, 10% loss for uh, Fresno and Yolo County. And between those who gain and lose, uh, it's about the same. Um, 31 counties above the red line are gaining a little bit, um, and 27, the rest of the counties uh, lose uh, funding as a result of proposed the change. Next slide. In addition to the overall distribution in terms of the percent change, we also look at 
how the patterns uh, would vary across the different county types. The, the four county types that we have here grouped into rural, rural, urban, urban, and urban, rural. Again, based on relative percent change, we see uh, the biggest difference between the large urban counties and small rural areas. So just looking at the patterns here, uh, we see a, uh, urban, a few of those urban counties, um, the percent change is relatively small. Uh, for example, Los Angeles, 30, probably 30% 30 everything that you look at this uh, statewide, it's about 30%. And the funding formula change hardly changed the, the pro rata share for Los Angeles. And San Francisco see some, somewhat of a decline. But compared to rural counties, you see a widespread in the percent change. Again, what we saw 30% increase for model and um, close to 10% decline in Imperial County. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. yeah. Here is trying to get a better sense about given the relative change, what's the size of the change and how that size change uh, is distributed. Here we see the, about 20 or so counties. Um, actually the change involves very small percentage change. Um, it's, it's less than $10,000 overall regardless the, the large percent change for a lot of those counties. So substantively, um, this proposed change of funding formula for many of the counties, 38, 39 counties, um, you don't see um, significant uh, change in the overall funding in terms of dollar amount. And if we look at the distribution of the dollar amount, going to the next slide, Again, divided by these four county types. Um, the bar charts showing for within each area, uh, the county types, those that would gain uh, fund additional funding and the, or lose and the net change as represented by the grain bars. Here you see overall shifts of the funding across the different uh, county types. There's small decline for rural uh, counties in aggregate, uh, somewhat a larger decline overall for rural urban counties. And then as we discussed earlier, the overall shift of the funding um, would go to urban or urban rural counties as a whole. Considering the overall dollar amount though, um, out of so 20 million uh, for allocation across all 58 counties. The That's shift. Oh, yes, sorry. Yeah, the shift of across all 58 counties, the net gain um, uh, compared to the net loss involves about $300,000, which is less than 2% of the old overall funding um, available for allocation to all 58 counties. So that's another perspective looking at the impact of this funding formula change. Regardless of the different patterns measured in relative terms or shifting the funding from one category of the fund, uh, counties to another, the overall impact in dollar amount is relatively small. Hey, Ron. Yes. Um, could you say again what you just said? I didn't quite understand that. The overall 300,000, I, I didn't understand what you meant by that. The summary well, this, this, this bar chart shows in aggregate, what we have here summarized is by the four groups of counties. Mm -hmm. So you see for rural counties, the net change is a small decline. Oh, okay. For rural urban, the net change is somewhat larger amounts involved, but net decline. Mm -hmm. If you sum up all of the changes, the plus and minus is for across all 58 counties. This funding formula change from 125 to 200 would involve shifting money around overall 
of $300,000 moving from one to the other, in, including those who gain and, and lose. It's the sum of the green, the sum of the green bars, basically. Yes, the sum of the sum of the green bars. Eric, we asked Ron to run the formula and everybody else um, based on the the twenty twenty one distribution for Ialta. So that's that was the twenty something million that, that Ron was using as a baseline, and and, and from there um, is the difference. Yeah. So the, despite the small amount involved in this um, impact analysis. Uh, the pattern that we saw here, why it's shifting in the way that we saw, um, the pattern is clear. It's driven by the distribution of income across counties and how inequality within each county is um, calculated to have an impact when we shift the funding formula from 125 to 200 uh, federal poverty level. And that's reviewed in this next chart where the impact um, measured as relative change for all 58 counties is laid out here in descending order from Monroe County gaining 30% to Yolo uh, losing 10%. So in the order, it's correlated with the other metric that we are looking at, which is the percent of population under uh, 125 federal poverty level. What the two trends is showing is the greater the proportion of poverty population as measured by 125%, the higher percentage um, of the loss. And when we shifted this funding formula from 125 to 200. And this is simply a function of the income distribution within each county. If we move to another chart showing similar kind of a pattern, the downward sloped line demonstrate the relationship between the two metric, which is the greater the population under 125% federal level, the greater the loss as we shift this funding formula to 125 to 200% level. And to the next slide is the final um, display of this pattern geographically um, group the changes in terms of percent change of the funding allocation to four groups. Those red counties, um, 16 counties, um, their change would, would show a, a decline of four to 12 percent negative, negative change. Um, those are the counties where the federal poverty level is the highest on average is 26%. And this is also behind the pattern of the change that we see across all of, all of the counties, depending on the distribution and the change from 125 to 200. So that's overall patterns about the impact of this proposed change. Um, if you have, anyone has any questions about this analysis. I think there were a number of questions in the chat. Um, one of them being that if you uh, increased the funding amount, so um, the 2021 distribution is about 20 million, but this past year, um, it was significantly larger. Would you expect amplified effects in terms of um, where funding may be gained and lost if you were starting with a, a larger funding amount? The easiest way to, to look at the impact of a larger funding amount is uh, using that relative change, that's precisely the purpose of using that relative change because regardless of how much money is involved, what we're looking at, the overall impact, is measured in that relative change. So 30% increase in model. When we increase the funding overall baseline from 20 million to 30 million, you would see the same percentage change for model and the decline will be the same for Yolo and Fresno. Thank you. Because there, there is a spreadsheet that's including your meeting materials where um, it doesn't show the um, 
the information graphically, but in a, in a, in a spreadsheet format. So you could see it on an individual um, from a, a per county basis. And if you look at mono by itself, um, the shift though is 30%, the absolute dollar amount isn't that much because uh, Mono gets a very small allocation. I believe it's around 6,000. So it shifts to uh, around 5,000. So it's only about a thousand dollar shift. But, but I think to go to point, Ron's point, um, the, the relative change is what we're, we're trying to focus on because um, you know at some point IOLTA interest rates will go back up high and we will be able to distribute a, a lot more money than we are in 2021 to 2022. Um, so, so then the, 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 the relative change there um, is, is a nice way to look at it. Well, Juan, we had a couple of questions in the chat, one from Will and a response from Catherine, um, asking if this analysis is based upon changing the threshold for eligibility or, or the funding allocation. This is just for um, the, the funding allocation. It, this is if we change um, the funding, right now the funding formula is based on 125%. If we change the funding formula based on, on 200%, this, is, this would be the impact. The change in terms of client eligibility, um, we, we know kind of anecdotally and we, we have a sense of trends and some of the remarks that Zahira said is some of the considerations, but we were not able to run, um, mm -hmm. say the formula of say to, to see how many more um, people a per at the organizational level would 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 be um, served. We just don't have that that data at our fingertips. But with the funding formula, um, Ron's um, office has helped us do the analysis. So we're we're not proposing to make a decision today. We wanted to preview the issue. Um, there can be more questions, of course. But Duan, just to to fast forward a little bit, can you explain what the proposal is for today? Yes, um, so if there are not any more questions on the analysis, um, we'll go to the next slide to talk about next steps. What? Sorry, actually, I think, uh, actually, there are a number, oh, okay. um, this is Madam Chair, there are a number of questions and comments in the chat, oh, okay. so start, like, starting back up with uh, Herman, I believe, okay. or actually uh, Catherine. Catherine, please. Yeah. Oof. Hold mm -hmm. on. So I, I think my question was was answered. Oh, okay. Do, do you want to share it, Catherine? It's really what was just discussed about what was so. As I understand it, this was based on twenty twenty one allocation, which is twenty million, but twenty nineteen was thirty million. And so, yes, of course, the relative percentage of change remains the same, four to twelve percent. But the dollars that would be impacted would be higher. So if you're running running a formula at a higher percentage and combining IOLTA and EAF, yes. that's gonna be a larger dollar amount. If you're running the, the, just IOLTA based on the 2019 number, the dollar impact is gonna be greater for the counties that are losing dollars um, than it would be using the, the 20 number. But it, that, that part is made. Exactly. I think relative percentage is the yeah. same, but the dollar impact, which yeah. is honestly what programs care about, what's available in the counties they serve, is gonna be is gonna be more. Yes. And and Catherine, you you make um, a, an excellent point that we should remind everybody. Um, we say IOLTA funding formula, but obviously this implicates EF funding um, because you all know um, EF funding goes out similarly as the IOLTA formula and eligibility as well. Um, so it's, you know, double impact, uh, if you can say, in terms of relative dollars. So Herman wanted to know what the difference is between rural urban and urban rural. Yeah, and then after that, we do have kind of a, a list going um, in order. So I know uh, Herman and Erica had very similar questions. And after that, if we can get to Bonnie, Bob, Will, of course, Corey. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Jim is on the line and I have to, uh, we, we, I do want to uh, give a special thanks to uh, Jim because he has been working with both um, Araya team and, and staff um, to do this analysis by our side. And um, that, that the definition of rural and urban rural came from an um, access commission um, report that um, Jim um, helped draft. So Jim, would you, would you mind um, providing everybody with that definition? Yeah, that was a update from the uh, rural access report that the access to justice commission did in uh, 2010. And there's the current report that was released um, last year is on the issue of the problem of um, rural housing and it's Appendix A. And basically what we do is we use uh, the definition of rural 
using the medical services study area definition of what is rural versus frontier versus urban. And we collapse the frontier and the rural into just rural categories. Jeez. And we cla classify all the counties based on their, their poor. And the rural areas are, rural counties are where all the poor are in rural MSSAs. The rural urban are counties which have both rural poor as well as um, urban poor, but that the uh, percentages are fairly close, like uh, Fresno, for example. Fresno has the most rural poor in the state, but it has even more urban poor. And then we have counties that are primarily urban poor, but has some rural poor, and those are the urban rural. And then we have some counties that are primarily 90% or more of their poor are all urban. And in particular, the two biggest of those are Orange County and San Francisco County. Those counties have absolutely no rural poor at all. It's all urban. So that, that report is freely available on the uh, California Access to Justice Commission website. So we have a, yeah, Did sorry. Just give him ask the question. You said that was based on 2010 data? No, no, it was an update of the 2010 report. This is based on 2019 data. Okay. Or, uh, well, no, let me correct that. I think it is actually, it was published in 2019, so it's 2018 data. Okay. So we have Bob and then Christian and um, Corey kind of lined up in the queue. Bob, do you have any comments to make? Okay, so this is Bob. Um, in looking at the changes, um, for the funding, if the formula was changed, um, it occurred to me, how do we know that um, everybody who's between 125 and 200% tries to go to a legal services agency and gets told, no, we don't have funding? My concern is that some people go to their community group, a social services agency, or church, or and they they see well 125 percent and I'm over that so they never bother to try and therefore the legal services agency doesn't know how much of a demand there is out there for services between 125 and 200. I'm concerned about the validity the measurement of the demand and and how that might affect the ability of let's say a smaller medium agency to serve people if suddenly FPL goes to 200 percent you know might they have a flood of people coming in and yet not enough funding or staff so validity of the um, um, numbers seeking services and how that might affect the staffing level thank you yeah, that, that's a really good point, Bob. And, and I think, um, you know, when we did the justice gap study, um, there was uh, some discussion about um, turn away a clients. Um, I don't know if you all recall uh, Jim and Ron, Erica, um, for that. And, and, you know, with the two panels that were done with the justice gap, I, I think they, they explored that. I don't actually know if there were questions around that, that we have that data at our fingertips. I don't believe we do, though. Um, the LSC um, justice gap study might have something more along those lines, right, Jim? I'm, I'm, in terms of turn away clients and um, the intake. Sorry, go ahead. Jen. No, I'm, I'm not sure it's got the turn away. It, it does increase the number of clients, um, but you gotta, you gotta keep in mind that a lot of our larger providers already that are funded by LSC are using that 200%. And you're never gonna have enough money, given the money we have today, you're never gonna have enough to, to satisfy demand. Um, I think it would probably help the agencies out, or at least from my understanding from the agencies, is to have a consistent standard. So if they have LSE allowing them to use 200% and we're restricting them to 125%, that can create problems in terms of administration. Oh, Corey, you want to, you got a question? Sure, thanks. I, actually, that last point I think is, um really a good one that to the extent this increases efficiency for programs and um, perhaps it could result in greater total numbers of people served. I don't know if it's that dramatic of a change or not, but it, it, um, 
it does seem like it would eliminate certain tracking. Um, I was just wondering if there's anything that we should know about how this maps onto um, actual numbers and size of providers, since they're of course clustered and um, not all, not evenly dispersed throughout California and, and um, just sort of asking generally, and, and maybe this is too broad of a question, but are there any distortions or uh, anything we should know about, about how this looks when it comes down to the fact that we have some counties where they're hardly served and some with a lot of different entities serving them. Corey, are you asking whether, how we know what the, I, I guess I, I what do you I'm just asking if there's any if there's anything we should be concerned about in in terms of the fact that um, I mean it was raised already um, by Zahira the question of small versus large programs and so I'm I'm just wondering if there are issues in terms of the um, the way that different programs are dispersed throughout the state that would interact with these changes that maybe we should be aware of. So it, it may be a different thing if you're reducing funding for a county and that county is, um, is served by a whole different a slew of programs and each one might have a kind of minuscule reduction in budget um, or is served by programs that primarily get their funding from other sources. And then this wouldn't cause as much of a dramatic change versus if you've got a county that with a, you know, a single provider that's primarily state bar funded, that would have a different kind of effect. And maybe this is not really possible to tell, but thought it was worth asking. Yeah, you know, we really struggled with how, um, to, to theorize the change at an individual um, uh, program level and then and then aggregate that that data for you. But the problem is the same issue for, with uh, what Zihero brought up is that we, we don't know for programs how many clients that they're serving above 125 to, in order to run that data. We, we might be able to theorize based on um, the percentage of qualified expenditures. So if a program say has 100% qualified expenditures, we know that they're serving only 125%. But if it's, it's, if it's less than that, it's, 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 it would be us making a guess. So we didn't feel comfortable at the staff level to make that type of guess to give you some, some type of projection that wasn't based on, I mean, there, there's a lot of factors that go into play, but we did contemplate that. It's just, we, we were unable to at this juncture. Um, when Erica and you know the rest of the staff, we all put our brains together. Can we move? We don't right? know how to do that layering. <laughs> is the problem. So Christian also had a comment. Yeah, I guess I I just wanted to I guess ask the group and maybe orient the the conversation about the propriety of the proposed change. And I know we're not making any decision today, but when I see sort of red lines and bar graphs that drop below, it, it just suggests that there's something um, bad about the outcome. And I, I don't know if I'm, that's just my own interpretation of it, but I guess I, I want to hear if people think that there's something wrong with the outcome because to me it seems sensible so chris and and this is um getting uh, um to the slide that we're gonna you know in the memo we did share preliminary staff recommendation um you know uh that that's based on this analysis um to not change the funding formula um you know the, the, like like ron said um the absolute dollar amounts isn't large when you look at it um 
from county to county, especially on the $20 million and when we ran on $20 million. So there's not a lot of um, shifts in, in, in terms of absolute dollars, but we, we do worry over time. And if, if the funding, the IELTA funding um, becomes, you know, increases again, um, what, what that changes. And so to kind of play a bit conservatively, the staff recommendation is to keep the funding formula at 125 um, so, so that we wouldn't have any um, shifts in, in funding across um, regions and, you know, high poverty areas and rural areas but to then still provide programs with that flexibility to increase the client eligibility though up to 200%. So that, that was what we thought was a, a good um, compromise in, in the situation. So, so the, the, the funding formula and el client eligibility wouldn't run in tandem with each other. So we keep, we keep kind of how um, the funding is spread across California the way it is now, because that's the way it's been done for 30 years. Um, but we, we give programs some more flexibility in client eligibility and who they can use our dollars to serve. Oh, Rich, actually Jeff has a comment as well. Jeff, go ahead. And I think Duane just hit it. And uh, what I was breaking this down to as I analyzed it is we've got two impacts here that I view as mutually exclusive. One is the impact on a county by county basis, which is driven purely by the formula. And that's the excellent analysis that we just received showing that impact. The second component is understanding the impact of an increased eligible population and how that is going to impact the individual programs and their capacity. So um, I, I'm looking at this from a mutually exclusive standpoint and it wasn't clear to me until that last comment that we could treat them that way, that we could continue with the current funding formula by county based on the 125 and then look at the ability to increase accessibility within the counties based on the 200%. Is that correct? That, that's correct. And you know, honestly, we as staff kind of didn't think of it that we always, because they, they run in parity with each other and you know, they mirror, right? The 125 on the client eligibility and the funding formula and our, and I'll speak for myself, um, it always, what hand in hand. And it wasn't until I think Judge Selman at one of the rules committee was like, it, you know, there are different parts of the statute. It, it really, you can, they are already decoupled. It's just, we have always thought of it together. So that was a little bit of an aha moment for all of us. And and, and we think that, that that is a good compromise. Hey, Duan, this would require a statutory amendment, right? That's a question Rich is asking. Yeah. Yes, so if we were to increase from uh, 125 up to some other level, perhaps 200, it would require statutory change. So it would not be, um, Obviously, the, the commission wouldn't have that authority. Um, we make a recommendation um, to the board of trustees to put it on their kind of slate of legislative priorities. And then um, we give um, kind of uh, Selena all this data and she would make the requests officially to the legislature. I raise, I raise a question, Eric, because we have, we're looking at this through the lens of a grant making body. We also have to think about the political problem that it might create. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that's why um, one of our next steps that we propose that we're already, um, uh, uh, you know, we'll be doing this week is getting, we, we want to run this analysis um, to the, uh, the legal aid community the same as we shared with you today, we, we want to have this similar conversation with them. So they're all fully aware of what the implications would be, uh, you know, to, to at a county level, at, you know, at an organizational level. Uh, so they're fully informed and then they will complete a survey and let us know, um, you know, what their desire is. If there is not consensus within the community, um, the recommendation um, from the state bar staff is that the commission not move forward um, with uh, with a recommendation to the board of trustees um, to 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 pursue this. Because if the community is divided, and if, if programs feel like um, a change may be harmful to their their you know, if we don't have consensus, then that that would be hard for us to take to the legislature. Um, and and that's that's where Selena is saying that she's already had preliminary conversations and. Um, Selena, I don't want to speak on your behalf, but um, I think she has said that she feels fairly confident that there, there will be consensus um, once the survey is sent out. So we'll need to so, confirm that. And if there's not, then, then it would be hard for us to move politically. So Erica has a question, and then I, in the interest of time, I would like to get on to the next slide. So Erica, why don't you ask your question? Uh, sure, thanks. This this is probably a, a hopefully an easy answer, but I noted that the it looks like lack, you know, or the the the, the, the second suggestion was to have more explicit and liberal income exceptions. Um, and I just want to confirm that we don't have that discretion to do that because of the statute as it's- That you do have discretion. That that piece could be a, a rule change, a state bar rule change. Okay, and so are we, 
considering that side of it as well? Yes, yes. We put kind of put a pin in this issue because of we're exploring this, but um, what the community wanted is kind of the formal list of exceptions. They wanted more guidance from us. But, I mean, one of the preliminary recommendations was, you know, we'll, we will we'll entertain exceptions similar to LSC. Uh, we want to provide um, the greatest amount of flexibility to programs, but programs wanted more direction, so they want a list for us. They want, they want us to give them a list. So uh, Erica and, you know, some of the other staff, we will be working on um, some more formalized recommendations around around that, that list and those exceptions to bring forward. Okay, and so, the, and so the thinking is that would sort of dovetail with the statutory change or be, but we, but we could also, they could also kind of be separate, right? So they they could be separate. We could move that along um, while we wait. We don't know how long a statutory change would take. Um, and maybe Selena could speak better to, to the legislative process, um, but, but you know. Yeah, okay. It, it I just could, wanted, it, yeah. Just wanted to make sure I understood that side of it. Thank you. Juan, do you see Kim's question in the chat? I, I don't. I'm sorry, because I have my slide up. I, I can't see any of the, the comment box. All right. So she's asking how many IALTA programs are also recipients of LSC funding and using the 200%. It's 11 LSC programs. Um, and again, there, there are larger programs um, in the state. Pharmacy, you also had a question? I, I do. We keep uh, calling for Selena. I, I have a couple of questions for Selena, if you might be able to weigh in, um, both from the legislative perspective, but also from the program's perspective, if you've heard um, any feedback. On, on increasing it to 200%? Yes. I mean, I, I think a lot of folks have really made the distinction that there's the eligibility threshold and the formula piece. And the formula piece feels especially complicated because it could be reallocating funds, um, whether it's small amounts or large percentages or however you cut it. Um, it, it feels a, a little tricky to reallocate funds in a time in which IOLTA will be decreasing, um, but that's not going to be our reality forever. And so we have to not just think about you know what happens next year or the next year, but what's going to happen 10 or 20 years from now when hopefully interest rates will finally improve again and maybe we'll get more federal dollars for, um, for legal aid. Um, but, but at least what I heard from programs, everyone really did want to increase the threshold. And I think that it's not just LSE funded programs who are using the 200%, it's all the programs who have other sources of funding at the 200%, whether it's Shriver or government contract. And, and I think that Dwan is right that, the, that you know, we could survey organizations, but I think looking at the QE percent is the only way we can really get a glimpse at how many organizations are really serving folks who are over um, the 125 threshold. Um, but then, Dwan, I think you're right that we would just be guessing at what percentage of that that you know delta is is you know 125 to 200 percent, or whether it's some other non-qualifying services. Yeah, we, we do have you know in the IELTS and EF application, we asked for other sources of funding, so we did contemplate why don't we run a report and then see how much of other sources of funding. But again, it's, it's it wouldn't be it wouldn't be precise for you, so we didn't feel comfortable making that type of uh, it would be many assumptions then to present to you some data that we we couldn't 100 percent stand behind. Catherine, did you want to make a comment as well? Um, I I was just saying I identified in a chat some things I thought we could look at, but I also think I mean the easiest way I think it's to get sort of who's serving who at what percentages is if there's a survey of programs to simply ask them. I mean, people are interested in this, and I think would be willing to say I serve people under whatever the it's 200% or maybe it's the housing percent and, and get some estimates from them, which is probably the quickest way to understand the impact of a change on a redistribution among programs in a particular county. So we have a survey drafted. Um, Ron, Erica, do you think that would be an easy add-on of a question for the current survey we have? That might vary depending on the number of counties each agency serve. Uh, if they have multiple counties, um, the question and the responses might be a little complicated. Well, if you just did it on two hot, like who serves, if the actual standard right now that we're looking at is who serves people at 200% of poverty level or something, you're, you're just going to use that information in all counties that that program gets an allocation from potentially? I mean, yeah, you if we don't get... care in the survey going out to all 100 or so count, uh, agencies, if we don't care about the distribution of the clients across multiple counties, then 
the level of analysis and the response, we can just ask them of all of their clients, the percentage breakdown. Um, so that should be pretty straightforward. Duan, this is, sorry, this is me and one comment. Would that give us a complete picture to the extent that there may be other groups that become eligible or become qualified to? Yeah, to... The, the other groups is a hard question to, to answer. Um, I, I can give you kind of a yearly average. The last five years, we've seen anywhere between three and five, uh, six new applicants. So, so we don't believe that like, you know, we increase to 200 and, to, and next year we're going to get 20 new applicants. I don't think that number is that, but but it but it it, it 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 still doesn't mean that it wouldn't be an impact um, because even if we got one or two organizations, but they are at the five million dollars or the ten million dollar mark, that, that that could really change funding because their qualified expenditures are so large. And there have been very large organizations that have applied for our funding um, that that would have been um, somewhat of a disruptive to our current grantees if had they been found eligible or moved forward with the application. So it's not just the sheer size, the sheer number of new app, uh, grantees that would be eligible, but also um, the, the size of their organization and their qualified expenditures. Duan, can you move on to the, um, uh, to the proposal? Of course. Of course. Okay, Erica, do you want to talk about this really quick before we move on to next steps? Um, this was Will's question about the cost of living and Sure. Um, so in addition to the 200% of the federal poverty level, we looked at area median income, um, both in terms of using that as the income eligibility threshold and implementing it in the funding formula. Um, so the Department of um, Housing and Urban Development um, creates these charts every year and uh, they do it regionally, it's um, in California, you can look at each county um, at their area median income. It relates to housing affordability and um, qualifying for um, certain housing programs. So they have different uh, percentages and categories. So 50% of the area median income would be considered a uh, very low income and 80% would be considered low income. This is something that organizations who use this measure for some of their other grants, they can run that calculation automatically. Um, I know some programs use things like Salesforce and so they just plug in the client's income and it tells them whether they qualify or not. Um, so from an income threshold standpoint, programs could apply that pretty easily, um, but the area median income varies greatly from county to county, which um, was included on one of the charts in your materials and which we can review uh, briefly later, but um, you know, the area median income in say LA would be very different from um, Imperial County. So um, when we tried to apply that to the funding formula, we just found it to be unfeasible. Um, it made it too complex um, because the measure is different from each county. And we also, unlike the American Community Survey, which we can use for the federal poverty level, we don't have a reliable data source to, to get that information um, using area median income. Um, you know, we, we would know, for example, I, I believe the ACS actually does provide information on median income in each county, but we don't know the distribution in um, say that bottom 50%. So we wouldn't necessarily know how many people are actually at 50% of the area median income or 80%. Um, and we would need, sort of individual or household level data, which we can't get. So um, it just, um, this analysis is much more brief because we just can't, we found it's, it's too burdensome, it's too complex to reliably apply to the funding formula. Um, so if it were considered, it should only be considered in the context of um, changing the income threshold to area median income, which is more responsive to um, sort of differences um, in uh, cost of living in different areas. Um, this also oh, I just want to add to that. I mean, we, we really try to run this um, to give you guys data, but but you know, um, Ron and and his uh, his team, they just looked at the available data, and it you know, it's not that it doesn't exist. But we don't have access to that. I mean, there's somebody that works for Ron that's an economist, and he looked into this issue for us, and it's just it's 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 just too burdensome, and it's not it's unfeasible, like Erica said. Um, and so similarly to. 
um, using 200% of the federal poverty level, this would likely, um, use of the AMI would likely significantly increase the numbers of organizations uh, that would be eligible for funding, um, which if that were the case, if we saw uh, a large increase in applications and eligibility from organizations that are not currently eligible for funding, it could reduce individual program funding. Um, and we also looked into cost of living, um, but it, it has the same issues as the AMI. Um, and a further limitation um, is that I believe it's only produced, um, information on that is only produced. The consumer price index is only used in metropolitan areas. So we don't have information on cost of living in rural areas and would need to essentially generate that ourselves. And um, so that's why we don't think that either AMI or cost of living would be viable options. Um, I don't know, if, Ron, if you have anything you wanna add about that. Um, analytically, I think it's important as many of you have mentioned about the distinction between using 125 federal level as part of the fund funding formula and different from that it, it, to use that as a way of measuring eligible um, clients to be served. Because 125, um, it's a good measure for poverty at a very severe level. It's no different than in international poverty, you use the figure of $1.80 a day. It's just a good measure for uh, indicating the prevalence of poverty. So when we look at the 125 poverty level and the distribution across 58 counties, and shifting that to 200, really the pro rata share as the key element of the allocation doesn't change much. I think that's why it's important to, to keep the distinction uh, analytically using the 125 as funding formula versus shifting to 200% as a uh, client to eligibility for service. And we'll try to wrap it up because I, I know we're um, cutting into our uh, other agenda items. Um, so Erica, can you just briefly go through this and then we'll get to the next steps. Sure. Um, so this chart just uh, was created and I think it was in your materials to um, give more of a visual of how um, these different thresholds look depending on um, what region or what county you're working in. So the current measure for a family of four would be 32,750 in terms of annual income. If you raised it to 200% across the state, that measure would be 52,400. Um, if you were to use the area median income, uh, whether 50% or 80% AMI, you can see that, um, as I mentioned, it really varies depending on uh, which county you're looking at. So um, it can go uh, for 50% AMI anywhere from 30, about 35,000 for a family of four, um, you know, up to uh, 65,000 in a place like Alameda County. And if you looked at San Francisco, I believe it'd be even higher. So um, there is a lot of variability, um, but it is more responsive uh, in terms of location um, to the, the difference in cost of living and income uh, throughout the state, which is um, pretty large. So, yeah. So this is just to give you an idea of if you were to use any of these measures, kind of what that would look like depending on which county. And then um, just briefly, next step. So uh, we um, have a, a webinar that's scheduled with all of our grantees um, this coming Thursday, um, which will also circulate um, the registration if, in case you're interested in attending, which we wanna run through this analysis with them and the options again, and answer any questions they may have. And then after that, um, we're gonna issue the survey and give them um, a two and a half week period um, to fill it out. Um, that, that surveys due back to us the beginning of January. Um, if there is consensus in, in the community, um, then um, we, we would like, um, oh, and we, we, we would like to ask you also to, to delegate um, authority to a working group to work with staff to then finalize that recommendation that we would present to the board of trustees to get onto the legislative priorities. So that's, that's the, the, the next steps and let me, um, the motion. Um, so, so again, because it's kind of quick, fast moving. Um, this commission doesn't convene again until February. So we were asking the commission to de delegate a group of three um, rules committee member to work with staff um, to finalize um, the recommendation. 
Um, so Amin, who's who's chair of the Rules Committee, um, Catherine Blakemore, who's also on the Rules Committee, and Jim, who's been um, really um, doing this analysis with us side by side the last few weeks. I'll move. I'll second. I'll second. Go ahead, Eric. I'll, um, I'll do roll call vote then. Thank you. Um, Bonache? Yes. I had a question before we vote. Of if course. You don't um, look at like the last couple of slides, looking at what I'm considering income inequality, especially in LA and some of the other kinds, would this proposed change have a significant impact on those that are at the 125% level in receiving services? Because if you raise it, you increase the individuals who will be able to receive service. And I'm wondering what would be the impact, I haven't clearly heard that, of those who may be at the 125% or lower. Yes, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I don't understand your, your, your question in terms of impact. Um, there, there'll be, I mean, and one of the things I guess that we did talk about, maybe this is what you're getting to, is that um, we already have limited funding. So if you raise and, and more people are eligible to use our funding for that, are, will that limit, is that your question? Will that limit the 125? You know, we think that, you know, the reality is some programs are already serving above 125, but they're using other sources of funding. We don't think that that would sacrifice, I guess, quality of services for clients um, uh, because our, our, our programs would use the funding on whatever they have responsibly. Um, there, there might be some shifts, but I don't think that if you raise it to 200%, that all the programs would then cluster and only serve um, individuals at the 200%. We still think that, that, that you know, there's going to be some distribution. And, and still, I, I, would, I would think a lot of programs, a lot of clients that would be served would still be below the 125 but how it actually play out, we, 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 don't, we don't know. Okay. Well, all right, I just took a bite. Yeah, I think your point, Herman, is that there's just gonna be more demand for a limited supply. Yeah, and those at the bottom of the economic totem pole may be the ones who are impacted the most because they may not be in as sophisticated or know where the services are, where those who may have a higher income may know how to manipulate or utilize the system where those who don't may not understand the process. Well, there'll, there'll still be outreach to, to everybody, but there, as others have commented, there may be a lot more takers if we raise the threshold to 200%. Yeah, and that's, that's my concern. What happened to those at the bottom of the totem pole? Well, I guess my resolution to that is just in practice, how I see that playing out is that if you've got somebody who's at 130% of federal poverty level now and has actually denied services, in litigation anyway, just to limit it to that particular band, that could be somebody walking out with a case that would have far-reaching effects downstream on the, on the um FPL. So you could have somebody who would be a great plaintiff with a great issue, not able to be served by that particular legal services organization, but litigation brought on behalf of that person would have huge effect for all the people who are actually at or below 125. And that seems to me to be, you know, when you're doing impact litigation, a huge consideration is who, who is the plaintiff to sort of take that kind of a case forward. So the sophistication and the income uh, disparity that you're identifying, I think is really worthy of keeping focused on, but I guess that level of sophistication can actually be a benefit, at least in the litigation context, having a client that's that marginally more stable or marginally more sophisticated. Um, you know, if the litigation is intended to serve everybody. Right, I would emphasize we're not deciding today to recommend any particular change. We're just appointing a working group at this point, to make a further recommendation. But that, that working group would have the authority to make the decision, correct? No, no. 
Oh, okay. The, 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 sorry, just to clarify, so everybody's um, very clear. So that working group would then, um, you know, uh, work with staff to, uh, once we get the survey results back and, um, and to make a recommendation to the board of trustees um, to put it on their slate of legislative priorities. And just to make clear, even the board of trustees doesn't have the authority to make the statutory change that has to be done at the state legislature level. So we're hoping if there's consensus in the community um, with, with both the, the, the results of the survey, the, the analysis, and if the board passed a motion to say that they support this, Selena can then take that data, all those data points, the motion, the analysis, and take that to the legislature. And that would be very compelling. Um, the, you know, advocacy point um, to, to, to make that change. But, but, but just to make clear, this commission doesn't have authority to make that statutory change, nor does the Board of Trustees. It has to happen at the state legislature. Although, although I think just to add clarity, I think to the point, this, this wouldn't, and maybe I'm wrong, Dawn, this wouldn't come back to the commission before it goes to the board. No, this would not come back. And that's, that's where you're delegating authority to the three member group. And again, if there's not consensus in the community, um, then the, we, the, the board, you know, we will not be bringing it to the board um, for approval, uh, for recommendation. Uh, Duan Zahira has a question. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, so my question is in terms of the survey and what the community will be asked and um, what the working group will be looking at, will they be looking at um, keeping the funding level the same, but increasing the eligibility or it's, keep increasing? It's both. Both. It's both. So we're asking them, um, uh, you know, uh, questions. Uh, one question is um, it, it kind of, um, and we, and Araya helped design the questions and Jim um, Jim also um, gave us feedback. So we're, we're pretty confident in the survey apparatus itself and the, the survey questions. Um, but there are questions around um, if, if they were to support an increase in client eligibility, um, you know, at what level will they will will they support it? And then there's another set of questions about um, what about the funding formula? If you uh, you, you know separate from from the client eligibility, do you do you, would you support an increase uh, a modification to the funding formula? Um, and so we would need consensus on both of those issues to move forward with anything. Any further comments before we vote? Uh, I have one question, just for Selena. Is this um this feels relatively like a relatively modest ask from the legislature? Is that simply because that's the thing the best we think we can get? And if we were to take more time to explore a more robust uh, suggestion, it would not be received well. And and what would you use as an example of more robust? Uh, mm -hmm examining um, what the legal aid agencies would prefer, what they think might be a good long-term solution that might be more future-proof than using FPL or AMI, just some of the alternatives here, which have generated a, a sort of robust discussion. Yeah, I mean, I think if you if you think about the history of the IALTA statute and the, and the reason why it comes to the state bar and, and the reason why it comes to the state bar as a formula grant is that they were trying, the legislature at the time was really trying to balance they created a pot of funding that, funding that was legislatively created and they wanted to have an agency um, with authority like the state bar to administer the funds, but they wanted to, to take away some of the power to make it all discretionary grants. And so the formula piece was their attempt at trying to, to be a compromise. Um, so I, I think that they would not like to take away some of that some of that formula and they would not want to give a whole lot more discretion unless it's a particular pot of funding like the homelessness prevention or those kind of funds that they create. Um, and I think that this, you know, as you as you mentioned, is a kind of a, um, a small change, whether it's 125 to 200 or something else. I think that they this year in particular, they might not be willing to take a more robust or big change because we've very much gotten the message from the legislature this year that it's not the year to make a bunch of big changes. And even so the um, legislature, you know, they their leadership is asking them to cut the number of bills they wanna propose in half and we're not gonna get a lot done this year. So this feels very small. It would be a proposed amendment to, the, to an existing bill. And I feel like it's accomplishable if we can get consensus. It's Thank you so much. I'll, I'll just, Catherine, just saying one other thing about the legislature is, you know, IOLTA as a statute was challenged with regard to its constitutionality. And part of the reason that it survived is because it was based on poverty level individuals as it was, was defined. 
And so one of the reasons I think to be mindful of expanding terribly far beyond 200%, which I think could be justified, is that it may raise if you get at incomes that are based on um, something equivalent to housing cost in a, in a community, that that will raise questions about whether or not there are new constitutional problems with the with the statute. So I guess I'm a minimalist in terms of change and incremental change, uh, because I think the worst possible outcome would be to jeopardize um, the constitutionality of the statute. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is Corey. Could I just ask quickly, um, what about some, uh, to build on Will's comment, there are some, there's some, um, statutory messiness with some of the other provisions of eligibility. And I wonder if there's any thought about, has been any thought about clarifying the other methods of eligibility other than income? Yeah, Selena and I- need to make it clear. Selena and I did talk, we think for this year, it's best to keep this as narrow as possible if, if, we, if we want to pursue this. Uh, but Selena, do you wanna add anything to it? Yeah, I, I think that you're right, Duan. That if we if we looked at anything that was too radical of a change, then I think it it, it could get so bogged up in the legislative system and so much additional debate that that nothing would happen. Um, but you know, I think Corey, that this is a, an issue that we could talk about in future years and, and think through whether it would be open for change. But I think that if, it would be very it, we would not have consensus in our community. I'll say that if we touch those other issues. Yeah. Yeah, Dwan, do you want to proceed with yeah. the roll call? May I? Thank you. Um, Bonachet? Yes. Eric? Yes. Amin? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Kim? Bartleson? Luis? Pamela? Yes. Catherine? Yes. Will? Yes. Erica? Yes. Herman? Yes. Rebecca? <laughs> Rebecca Delfino? Corey? Yes. Zahira? No. Jim? Yes. Deborah? No. Bob? No. Rich? Yes. Kim Savage? Yes. Chris? Yes. Christina? Yes. I have uh, 16, Chris. Um, I had 15 yes to no. Would uh, man oh. and uh, plant hold were, were no's for me. Oh, I have. Oh, sorry, Ms. Myers, I missed 16 and two. Six, yes, I have 16 and two too. So motion passes. Okay, thank you. Thanks everybody, That's, that was a great discussion. Let's move back to the homelessness prevention grant set of items. Uh, this, this is uh, item number four on the agenda. And I would note that the first three of those items relate to things like unspent funds and how they're gonna be distributed and approval of budgets and things like that. I think relatively straightforward matters. Item D is the review of the most recent RFP, which may require a little more discussion. So I'm just thinking in terms of our time and presentation, maybe we ought to be mindful of that. So who's got, who's got, who's driving that one, Dwan? Um, it's Christine and, um, and Chris. And um, would you like me to run the slides for you? Yes. Chris, did you want to start with just some some background? Yes. Sure. Um, okay. I'm gonna blaze through this, but hopefully be clear. Please let me know if you need to stop, but we we will uh, try to be efficient. So we received. Uh, I'm gonna do just a quick uh, review of what has taken place. We got twenty million dollars the year before this one for homelessness prevention. 
uh, that money went out in a combo of um, formula funding and grant making. Um, this year, in response to the pandemic and the eviction crisis, the legislature allocated $31 million, basically ran it back uh, with more money. Uh, we met as a commission to discuss this. Of that $31 million, 75% of it was allocated by a formula funding to existing grantees. 25% was subject to a, uh, a competitive RFP process. So the money in the RFP process was approximately $7.3 million. In September, I believe it was September, um, we held a convening uh, with the community and encouraged ambitious goals for the $7.3 million. 140 people attended the convening. Out of that, we ended up with 39 RFPs or uh, proposals from um, organizations around California. Uh, the total ask for, the, uh, for that $7.3 million approximately was 39 million. So there was a request for 39 million out of those 39 proposals. We had $7.3 million to give away. The way we uh, analyzed those 39 programs was that we set up a, an eight person uh, homelessness prevention committee. That committee met numerous times, including finally this morning uh, led by at a staff level by Christine and with lots of very helpful staff um, assistance from Dan and Dwan, Elizabeth uh, and others. And essentially what we did was each group, um, each of the four groups analyzed 10 of the grants um, of the grip applications we scored them using a rubric. We had multiple meetings to try to calibrate the grants within our uh, groups and between the groups. And then finally on December 3rd, the full committee met to have a discussion of all of the grants to review the scoring that had sort of emerged, uh, the preliminary scoring that had emerged out of the four group meetings and then to come up with a final proposal. Out of that final, or out of that um, process, we, we came up with a, a proposal that you're gonna get today, not to bury the lead, but it's, it's 12 proposals that we have voted to grant at funding levels below what they requested. Uh, but these were the sort of top scoring programs on the rubric that we applied. Uh, and, and that's the, the overall. Now we're going to talk and ultimately vote on both the allocation um, on the formula funding, which is the 75% or the $24 million. We're also going to take a vote today on the uh, 12 that are recommended here answer any questions you have about the process. And I guess the one other thing that I would say is that the process was challenging in many ways. Um, I really wanna commend the staff and the committee members uh, for the work that they did. And I, I'm just gonna highlight two things. One is, as many of us already know, it's very difficult to select against very worthy programs, but that was certainly the task at hand. We had 39 applications. They were very high quality. Uh, the grant money we had to give away was oversubscribed in every way, both by the number of programs that were seeking the money, as well as the overall money that we were given to give away. So that was 
number one. Number two, just the, the grant process itself uh, was we utilized this rubric. Uh, I think we learned some very valuable lessons about the rubric and about the use of a rubric. And that was a learn on the job type situation. We communicated to the programs how the rubric would be used. And so, you know, to sort of maintain fidelity to that communication, we, you know, I think we identified ways that we would improve the process, but we did really try to, to stay faithful to what had been communicated to the programs. And, you know, as is the case when you have this many sort of smart and thoughtful people in the committee, I think the, the process was very earnest. Um, the questions and the interpretations were very thoughtfully considered. And I want to be really clear, you know, among the many things that we discussed, I think most of us emerged from this uh, process believing not that there was some objective truth to any particular decision or particular approach, but just that um, there was a need to communicate as effectively and as clearly as we can in the future about what we privilege, what we want to see privileged, and and what we what we like uh, and need programs to do to communicate most effectively. So there was a lot of work done by the committee to sort of refine that, uh, making grants decisions in public is a challenge. And we're gonna discuss that going forward. But I, I, I do think there was a lot of candid conversation uh, and I think really terrific programs are part of this recommendation. Uh, and, I, and I think it's gonna end up being really well received and very impactful uh, as it's rolled out. Christine. Great. Thanks, Chris. So I think um, uh, with that, maybe it makes sense to stay on uh, this action item, um, which uh, is uh, for the RFPs, as you see here, um, with the 12 listed. And, you know, just to, to echo what Chris noted, um, I think the, the committee feels really strongly about, uh, about the quality of, of these particular projects, um, and it was a very hard decision. And I just wanted to note uh, some of um, with the work that these programs are gonna be doing um, that scored very highly. Like for instance, uh, Public Interest Law Center, um, they're going to be working on housing element. Um, California is, uh, as they noted, California is beginning its next eight years housing element cycle during which all communities must revise our housing elements, the, the housing elements of their general plans to make adequate provision for the housing needs of all lower income households. And they are going to be uh, training and providing expertise and litigation capacity to QLSP attorneys statewide on housing element uh, preparation and enforcement. Uh, Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles um, is proposing a um, tenant debt defense project, which will establish a replicable model to assist tenants with the consequences of the COVID-19 Tenant Relief Act of 2020, um, known as AB 3088, which turns outstanding rent owed into consumer debt addressed in small claims court. And this project will develop pro bono trainings for volunteers uh, to work with litigants to answer individual questions, draft answers, and pocket briefs, prepare evidence, vacate default judgments, prepare for hearings, and provide other services, um, among other things. And uh, another one of these, I'm not going to go th through all 12, um, but just want to highlight uh, a couple. Um, Western Center on Law and Poverty is a collaboration of four um, state bar funded organizations and they're going to address some of the unique barriers to affordable and accessible housing for the low income population in the San Joaquin Valley. 
um, by looking at equitable transportation systems, clean drinking water, necessary neighborhood services, employer provided housing and improved infrastructure. Um, and I also wanted to note um, that uh, legal aid of San Bernardino is also on this list uh, with a project entitled um, ensuring equal access through technology. And they are working with the Stanford Design Lab to help create a, a text helpline conversational tool uh, that will be programmed to provide basic legal help. Um, and uh, for those of you who were able to attend the convening that Chris mentioned earlier back in September, um, Margaret, and I'm blanking on her last name, um, from Stanford Design Lab was there and presenting. Um, and that was something that, uh, Hagen, thank you, Selena. Um, uh, something that uh, a number of grantees, uh, you know, picked up on, reached out uh, to work with her, whether it was, you know, for an RFP or the formula or, or just to, to work with um, the design lab on other issues. Um, but we were really impressed uh, with this collaboration. Um, and he's, uh, and um, LASSP is also working with uh, LAWYA to, um, work on uh, um, document, uh, uh, document tools. Um, so there were a lot of, a lot of great proposals um, and a wide variety, the, the depth and breadth of the services that um, these organizations were providing um, was, it was really hard to uh, to choose, um, as, as Chris noted, and as we discussed uh, in our meeting earlier today and our meeting back in December. Um, so, Duan, if you want to move to the next slide really briefly. Um, this, this map uh, is a little bit misleading because these dots are all of equal size, they're not really identifying the amount of funds that's necessarily going to these areas, but we did want to show uh, a representation of um, the areas where these projects are gonna be serving. And you'll also note that uh, two um, public interest law project and um, HERA housing and economic rights advocates will be working statewide. Um, in addition to uh, where um, the projects are working throughout uh, California. Well, the, the implication of that is just that the, the blue dots are all part of a single project. Also, if I could add, um, th these dots represent, only represent the, the RFP portion of the HP funding that was authorized for this year. They don't represent the formula funding, which is actually a much bigger number. And um, we haven't shown how the formula funding is distributed on this map. It'd be pretty complicated to do that, but that funding is going all over the state. Yes, yes, thank you, Eric. Um, and that is included in your meeting materials. It, it was um, a little bit, uh, too great of a challenge given our, our time constraints to, to uh, develop a formula funding map, um, given that 71 programs are receiving funding and working uh, amongst many different uh, counties, but that's in a um, Excel format showing where the, the counties that they're working in. And um, it is almost uh, three times the amount that we're talking about here with the RFP for the formula funding we're distributing over $22 million. Um, and we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit more when we go back to that agenda item. Um, so if you wanna go, uh, or yeah, we can go to the resolution or if you wanna go back to the, to the list. I guess I, I want to just uh, preface a, a call for any questions or comments from the commission or anybody else. Um, 
in, in this section, Eric, not sorry to overstep if I was, but um, it would sure. only would only just say one thing, which is um, the, the, this process of the committee bringing the recommendation to the commission is one that may be familiar to many commissioners uh, as we work in sort of these subcommittee and standing committee uh, processes. Um, this one was unique in many ways. And I want to underscore that th this process was extremely robust and also ex extremely expedited. And as a result, um, it really required sort of an extraordinary amount of effort on the part of staff, but also on the committee members who had anywhere from three to four meetings, as well as, you know, very detailed um, grant proposals to review. And I would describe uh, all of our conversations as being uh, very respectful, but uh, far from uh, full agreement on these things. So I very much appreciated how, um, yeah, just how fulsome our conversations really were. I think that they are very much going to inform the way in which the, this commission uses the rubric process in other areas and going forward. And I think it highlighted, um, you know, just the high quality of staff work and also the, the work of the commissioners who were on the committee, I, which I just, uh, I think it's really worth remarking on that. I, I'm very grateful to, um, to have exposure to that and um, to contribute in a very small way relative to my other committee members. So I'm really grateful to everybody's uh, efforts on that. But if there's questions or anything like that, I, I can answer them, Christine, or really any, any member of the committee as well. I'd encourage you to, to pipe up. I put a question in the chat and I'm now gonna click enter the right at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to know how soon will you actually see the results of all of the, the grant funding? How, you said how, how, how soon? How soon will you actually cool. see the actual, the clients receive the resources to get off the street, get into housing? When do you all anticipate some results in terms of help reaching the, the dollars, reaching the people? So we, um, oh, go ahead, Christine. You won. <laughs> Um, I can, uh, I'll start and then um, and, uh, Duan can jump in too. Uh, so with the $20 million uh, of the initial funding that Chris alluded to at the very beginning, um, we're going to um, ask grantees to give us um, kind of an interim uh, report out, um, but that funding ends uh, in June, on June 30th, 2021. So they're going to give us a full report out on, on that particular funding, um, I believe, in, in August. Um, we'll have some, some data uh, in March of this year with that interim uh, report. And then for uh, the three-year funding that we're talking about right now, uh, we'll be asking for, for data every um, the, the uh, complete and annual evaluation. I was just going to add that um, the the projects are expected to launch January 1st of 2021. So we've been in communication with all 12 of these projects to let them know that um, there's a strong likelihood that they will receive funding and that we'll let them, we'll notify them as soon as this meeting is over. Um, you know, we are working at lightning speed. Um, Grady just finished drafting the grant agreement for this HP funds. It's actually literally sitting in my inbox and I need to review it because we're moving fairly quickly and distributing the grant agreements and then getting the checks out um, as, as sometime in January or February as, as close to the January 1st um, uh, launch as possible. We've asked programs that if there's a, um, a hardship um, because they're not receiving the grant funds, um, they won't be receiving the grant funds um, uh, before they launch um, to let us know. And they've all said that it's, it's fine. Um, but the expectation is that they launch the project January 1st. Uh, Duan Zahira has a comment or yes. a question. Thank you. Um, so thank you to the committee for all of the, the work um, and on the expedited timeline and just the thoroughness of it. Um, 
My comment is more, it, it's less to, to these because there's already been so much work that's gone into it. Um, and there's also the expectations of the organizations that applied um, and their understanding of it. But when I look at some of the, the scoring um, and, and how the scoring is laid out, so proposal quality, um, which I'm not sure exactly what that means, that's 40 points. And so if an organization doesn't score well in proposal quality, it's really hard for them to catch up. And um, I'm just curious in terms of what that represents um, because you, there, there are people you can hire who, who do this all day and they can write really, really beautiful proposals, but you need to have enough funding to be able to hire them. Um, and if an organization doesn't have that, then it doesn't seem as if they would be able to make up the points somewhere else. Um, which then would kind of have a little bit of favoring um, towards organizations that are already fairly well resourced um, in terms of, of this type of, uh, of scoring outline. So I just wanted to, to, to raise that. It may be in the future, if we have this opportunity again, that it may be that it's a difference in terms of like how, um, whether, whether that is weighted as heavily um, in the future, but I just wanted to, to raise that um, as, being, as being something that in the future, I'd like to be able to discuss further. But if I if I could just say, so here a good great point. We were very mindful of that, of the bias toward sort of the richer organizations with the better grant writers. I mean that is a fact, and um, and Chris can respond, and others can respond. I think we did the best we could to try to look through the drafting and try to understand the substance of the proposal and where it was located and who it was impacting and whether it was rural and whether it was innovative. Um, and uh, all I can say is we did the best we could to try and evaluate objectively what we thought was the quality of the organization. But we, we were definitely mindful of that, of that bias, potential okay. bias. Go ahead, Kim, I can respond to that as well. Okay, um, well, I was going to say something similar to Eric, which is what we were aware of how the grant may have been written and um, we were mindful that some of the programs had a lot of experience in grant writing, may have had more staff to do it, um, but we also could read a grant that may have been written beautifully but was lacking in substance. So we really looked at very carefully at um, both the substance of what was being proposed as well as the manner in which it was communicated. But, um, you know, we were, we, were we were mindful of what process a program might have gone through to produce uh, their RFP. And again, I, I, I would, any other committee members are, are welcome to add to that. I, I was gonna give a, what I think is maybe a helpful uh, example of what we actually faced in that specific um, category. So we struggled with that as well. Um, I think actually future rubric uh, models actually will take into account the substance of your comments because of precisely the thing that you identified, which is that you can lose a significant number of points in a category that's so heavily weighted and then find that even if the rest of your application tops out at you know the rest at the high end of every other category you just you can't make up the difference uh, so we did use our december 3rd meeting to calibrate with that in mind um, that's point number one uh, and i think we as Kim and Eric both said, I think we did, you know, really identify that as an issue and then address it. The second example I would give, or second point is, you know, the, the Legal Aid Society of San Bernardino, San Bernardino is a good example of sort of how we addressed that. Um, that's a program that has, um, I think, struggled in some respects relative to other programs to maintain you know consistency in its leadership and we think they're really on the right track we did a pretty deep dive in terms of identifying and speaking with their 
uh, their, that program. And what was really notable when we looked at that in the subcommittee of the committee and then as the committee as a whole is that we recognized that really what they were doing was expanding their services into parts of California that really there are no services being offered at the moment. And so the ability to sort of see the quote unquote quality of the proposal really did require us as a committee to, to see past the, the burnish of certain programs, um, the certain program applications to the actual substance of what was being uh, proposed. And I think the last point I'd make there is that there really is, as any grant maker knows, there is not like an objective truth here. And I wanna underscore this, I sort of alluded to this issue, but when you have a program that is asking for $100,000 to, for example, address intractable cases, and the proposal you know, recognizes that those cases are extremely labor intensive, and $100,000 will address the problem of homelessness for, uh, I'll make up the number, 10 people. I think the committee struggled with, um, you know, with this idea, of, is that the highest, best use of $100,000 to help 10 people? Or is, is there some benefit to trying to spend $100,000 to address the problems of a larger group? The, whatever determination is made in that sort of choice, I don't know that there's one that's objectively right. I mean, those 10 people are valuable and that $100,000 is well spent, but in the sort of the calculation that we have to make in selecting, you know, 7 million out of 39 million, uh, those are the kinds of choices that I think we, we did make and were really thoughtful as we could be. I think if um, there aren't any other questions, I, I haven't seen anything else pop up in the chat. Um, maybe we can go to the, the motion. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll make the motion if Eric is entertaining him at this point. Sure. <laughs> the one on, this, on the screen at the moment. Any seconds? I'll second it, Eric. Thank you. Second. Let me get to my roll call sheet, sorry. Okay. Um, Bonachet? Yes. Sorry, I have to create another call. Eric? Yes. Amin? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Kim? Bartleson? Luis? Pamela? Yes. Catherine? Yes. Will? Abstain. Erica? Yes. Herman? Yes. Rebecca? Yes. Corey? Yes. Zahira? Yes. Jim? Yes. Deborah? Yes. Bob? Yes. Rich? Yes. Kim Savage? Yes. Chris? Yes. Christina? Yes. I have 18, Chris. Me too. Okay, motion passes. Okay, terrific. So we've spent quite a bit of time on two items, but but these are the two items on the agenda that I do think deserve the most attention. And thank you for the great discussion. So why don't we double back to the rest of the homelessness prevention items in uh, in section four? Great. Um, Dwan, if you can go, I think it is slide three. Slide three. Okay, oh, this slide, but uh, back one. Really quick. 
topic. Okay, great. Um, so uh, just a really quick background on the required mid-cycle expenditure report. Um, as noted, the, the $20 million that we received, the EAF Homelessness Prevention Fund, um, has to be spent down as per the legislation by June 30th, 2021. So at the, um, at the very beginning, grantees were, were notified that we were going to have a report where they uh, tell us what their expenditures were, and then we would project whether they were on track to spend down their funds um, by the end of the grant period. Uh, this was delayed a bit because of uh, COVID. Um, it was originally scheduled uh, for June um, and was delayed uh, through September. Uh, so grantees completed this report. Um, we had a state bar projection, which it took their uh, September expenses and multiplied them by the remainder of the grant period, and then also provided the grantees um, uh, an option to make their own projections and explain to us um, how they had projected whether they were going to be able to spend down the remainder of their funds. Um, and they also indicated on this report whether they were in a position to spend um, additional funds if grantees were going to return funds that they couldn't expend. Um, so <laughs> realize that's saying the, the same word a lot. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, if we go to the, the next slide really quick, I think this will kind of help formulate that. Um, so th uh, most of the grantees indicated that they were able to expend all of their, their grant funds and their explanations were provided in your materials today and were reviewed by the committee. Um, and those explanations were approved by the committee. So they're recommending um, approval from the commission today for those. And just wanna note uh, a few things on this slide. So the return formula funds uh, were 259,219, um, not a large amount. Like I said, most grantees expect that they can fully expend their funds. And then um, the, the RFP funds, 74,077. And just one thing that we, uh, one other thing we also wanted to note is with the redistribution of the funds that are being returned, um, we are going to adjust the allocation, that original allocation, uh, because when it was first made um, where the administrative costs, uh, those costs that we could bill uh, to the 20 million, which was capped at 150,000 uh, was taken uh, solely out of the formula 75 distribution. So we're just adjusting the redistribution allocation to make sure that we um, are accurately providing 75% of the 20 million to formula and 25% to the RFP. Um, so if you wanna go to the next slide. And as I mentioned, uh, the, the grantees provided an explanation um, for their projections and the common reasons um, for the variances between their projections and the state bar projection was uh, the use of payroll protection loans, delays in hiring, pauses in services and changes in non-personnel expenses. And you can imagine because a lot of these programs were ramping up right before COVID hit um, that uh, all of these reasons um, completely made sense. Um, and affected almost all of the projects. Uh, so as I mentioned, um, the committee reviewed this and uh, approved all of the, the narrative explanations. So the next slide. Um, so that brings us to the proposed resol resolutions. I know I went through that really quickly. So if there are any questions, um, before we move to the resolution. Okay.
would anyone like to make a motion? Mr. Chairman, this is Jeff. I'll make a motion to approve the proposed resolution as presented. I can second. So debate, I got a question, Bob Planthold. Okay, go ahead, Bob. Um, bear with me, but do we have a statement somewhere or an analysis that legal services um, that preventing homelessness is a necessary demand for legal services funded by us. I know it's important from a social welfare, from a public health, from a variety of reasons, but I'm looking at the, the curmudgeon opposite viewpoint that some maybe in another part of the country might hold that. So why should attorneys get involved when it's more a case of mental health caseworkers, social workers, healthcare workers. Do we have any sort of statement why this is important and necessary to help with any questions about the validity of this funding allocation? But Bob, these, I'm not sure I understand your question. Maybe others do. I mean, these are legislatively approved funds that we are distributing pursuant to a legislative formula. Okay. Got it. I missed that. Thank you. I'm sorry. I know Jeff made the motion. Who, who, um, who's second uh, Chris, question? Chris. Chris. Okay. Find out more. <clears throat> Eric, are there any other comments? I'm sorry. I can't see the box. Okay. Can I do roll call then? Yes. Um, Bonache? Yes. Eric? Yes. Amin? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Kim Bartleson, Luis, Pamela? Yes. Catherine? Catherine, yes, but abstaining as to Disability Rights California. Thank you, Catherine. Will? Yes. Erica? Yes. Herman? I got a question. I'm on the Disability Rights Legislative Committee. Should I um, abstain because of that? Um, if you feel like it's a conflict, you, you can ex uh, um, uh, abstain. Just for clarity, I will abstain. Okay, thank you, Herman. Thank Rebecca? You. Yes. Corey? Yes. Zahira? Yes. Jim? Yes. Sorry. Oh, Duan, I just want to abstain as to Disability Rights California. Thank you. I'm sorry, who who was that? Let's see here. Thank you. My yes. Apologies. No problem. Deborah? Deborah? Yes, I'm sorry. Sorry. Thank That's you. okay. Bob? Yes, but if Bay Area legal, legal Aid's on that list, I abstain from that. Okay. Rich? Yes. Kim Savage? Yes. Chris? Yes. Christina? Yes. Nineteen, Chris, is that right? Me too. Okay, motion passes there. Okay, let's move on right. to the other HP issues. <clears throat> okay, so this is actually very similar. Um, grantees were uh, allowed to notify us of a budget revision in that same report, um, the ex mid cycle expenditures report. And um, three grantees uh, had revisions that were over 25%, uh, which require commission approval. And those are on the screen here, Bay Area Legal Aid, um, Yuba Sutter Legal Center for Seniors and Public Law Center. Um, and the budget revisions fall in line with the same reasons for the, the deviations uh, from the uh, projected expenses. Um, grantees were using uh, the, the PPP loans um, as well as shifting to remote services, which account uh, for a lot of the revisions. It's, it's very similar to what we have seen with all of the other uh, budget revisions for the different grants, um, the IELTA EAF 
uh, bank grant and so on. Um, and then the list below also just is in, for informational purposes, these revisions uh, were reviewed and approved by staff because they were under 25%. Are there any questions? No questions. I would move that we adopt the resolution that's shown on the screen there. Second. I'll do roll call. Bonachet? Yes. Eric? Yes. Amin? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Kim Bartleson, Luis, Pamela? Yes. Catherine? Yes, and I don't believe Disability Rights California is being voted on. I don't have that page in front of me. No, that... they're not one of them. Thank you. Will? Yeah. Erica? Yes. Herman? Yes. Rebecca? Yes. Corey? Yes. Zahira? Yes. Jim? Yes. Deborah? Yes. Bob? Yes, but abstain for Bay Area Legal Aid. Thank you. Rich? Yes. Kim? Yes. Chris? Yes. Christina? Yes. Chris, uh, 19? Me as well. Okay, motion passes. Thank you. So I believe we have one more item. Yeah, yes. go for it, Christine. <clears throat> okay, and this item is to um, discuss and approve the recommendation of the 2021 uh, Formula HP Awards. And you um, received that list in the meeting materials. Um, and as we mentioned before, it also included the counties uh, where the projects and programs will be providing services. Um, so uh, the 71 eligible programs uh, completed their formula applications and staff reviewed those applications. Uh, and uh, just really quickly, what made um, part of the eligibility uh, for programs was that they had to be uh, doing the uh, landlord tenant dispute work currently. Um, and so this, this application was um, a bit more streamlined than the, the RFP application where they were explaining uh, what makes them eligible for this funding and then also what they propose to do with the funding. Um, so they, uh, the committee found all 71 homelessness prevention, um, sorry, all 71 programs uh, eligible and then uh, the formula budgets uh, with their allocations were released on October 28th. Uh, they returned their budgets on November 13th and the committee um, approved the recommendation for the formula budgets this morning. Uh, Christine, I think I just have one clarification. Um, sure. 71 applications were approved, but there was one that was not approved because of late submission. Yes. That correct, okay. Um, are there any questions regarding the, the formula applications? I just have uh, some remarks. Um, being cognizant of uh, the time, um, I wrote them down. So I just wanted to submit them for the record. I know we won't be able to act on them or really have any discussion, but as long as they're, they're on the record and it can be something utilized in the future, uh, that would be great. Duan, I sent you the PDF and I can just post in the link if that works so that it's available to everyone. I, okay. I can, um, if you just sent them to me, I can forward them on to the commission. Sure. That sounds great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Any other discussion on, on this item? There's still, there's still outdoors. I see we have some discussion. <laughs> <laughs> May I ask Will a question? Will, is your comments related to this particular motion? Yes, yeah, that's why. Oh, should we, should we, should I send them right now before we vote or how would you like to do this, Will? 
No, I don't think it's going to change the disposition here. So I think we should expedite the process. Can you just summarize real quickly what your issues or concerns are? I think the uh, uh, biggest issue is I uh, disagree with our spreading out the grant allocation over three years instead of doing a lump sum immediately. Okay. Is that it? I mean, there are other smaller issues, but uh, that's the, the big one. Any other comments? Well, I would move that we adopt the resolution. This is Jeff, I will second. Great, I'll do roll call vote. Bonache? Yes. Eric? Yes. Amin? Yes, and I just wanted to mention, just for all of my votes today, I'm abstaining with respect to LAFLA. Thank you. Jeff? Yes. Kim Bartelson, Luis, Pamela? Yes. Catherine? Yes, with abstention to Disability Rights California. Thank you. Will? Abstain. Erica? Um, yes, but, and I should have mentioned this on the earlier one, I need to abstain from Community Legal Services for East Palo Alto. Okay. Thank Herman? you. Yes, but um, abstain for disabilities, right, California? Okay. Rebecca? Yes. Corey? Yes. Zahira? Yes, um, abstaining for disability rights, California. Jim? Yes. Deborah? Yes. Bob? Yes. Rich? Yes. Kim? Yes. Deb? Chris? Chris, are you still there? Uh, yeah, I am, yes, sorry. Okay, thanks. Uh, Christina? Yes. Eighteen, Chris, is that right? I have eighteen as well. Okay, great. Motion passes. Great and I uh, forward um, Will's comments. Thank you. From my email. Thank you. And, and thanks again to uh, Christian and Christine and staff and all the commissioners that, that did uh, really great work on the on the HP, the, the, the set of HP issues this year. Let's move on to partnership grants. Item five on the agenda. Did you uh, ping Justice Murray? Yes, he's back. I, we saw him, so we didn't we didn't email oh. him. <laughs> um, um, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, hi, everyone. Um, hopefully this will be a fairly quick report for both um, partnership grant agenda items. We have two. The first I'll talk about is item 5A, review and approve 2020 budget revisions and caregiver requests. On the posted agenda, there's an attachment with a very um, large spreadsheet with the descriptions, but I'll give you the breakdown in our next slide. So um, go on, next slide. Great, um, so just as a reminder, this was the um, recommendation that was approved by the commission back in June, um, adopting a, a more flexible approach uh, in terms of um, a flexible approach for but, um, partnership grant budget revisions and caregiver requests for 2020. So that's just for reference. I'll go ahead and uh, move forward. Next slide. Um, so the deadline to for programs to submit their 2020 partnership grant budget revisions and caregiver requests was on November 20th. Um, the partnership grants committee met on December uh, 1st and unanimous, unanimously uh, voted to approve all requests. As a summary, and as I mentioned, that attachment does have the, the more specific details. Uh, 14 requests were received. Uh, three of them were below 25% um, because staff had authority to approve them. Those were approved. 11 were um, elevated for the committee committee's review. Um, as you can see, their four requests were between 26 to 49% and seven requests were um, slightly uh, larger with 50% or higher. Um, I did want to highlight that we did receive a budget um, revision from CLA SoCal's um, Unlawful Detainer Workshop at the Norwalk Superior Court. They were requesting a 50% reduction for um, its 2020 grant award, um, which has not yet been dispersed due to a delay in the MOU. 
MOUs um, to date, we, we, do, we, we do have the MOU, um, we did receive it. So we just wanted to, um, I just wanted to bring, raise that with the commission in case I had any questions uh, before approval. Um, so next slide. Um, so this is a proposed um, recommendation um, on the screen um, if the commission concurs with the committee's recommendation. I'm happy to answer any questions at this point. What happens to the reduced funding on the, on, for the one organization that requested a reduction? Yeah, so this is for their 2020 grant. Um, they were granted a 2021 award. I think they were just being realistic in terms of how much they wanted, they were requesting to carry over and get this first. And as opposed to returning the money, we just, um, they were looking to get that reduction at the, at the initial disbursement rather than trying to return the funds. And then those funds will then be put back into the pot for the 2022 disbursement. Okay, thank you. Any questions or discussion of this item? Okay, do we have a motion? It's all moved. This is Jeff, I will second Bob's motion. Do roll call vote. Um, Bonashe? <clears throat> yes. Eric? Yes. Amin? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Kim Bartleson, Luis, Pamela? Yes. Catherine? Yes. Will? Yes. Erica? Yes. Herman? Yes. Rebecca? Yes. Corey? Yes. Zahira? Yes. Jim? Yes. Deborah? Yes. Bob? Yes. Rich? Yes. Kim Savage? Yes. Chris? Yes. Christina? Yes. A 19, Chris? I have 19 as well. Okay, motion passes. Thank you, everyone. I'll go ahead and hand it off to Christina, who will report on 5B. Thank you. Yes, I'll take that. Similar to what we saw with Chris's presentation in the HP committee, uh, partnership grants are also discretionary funds and we've been given direction by the Board of Trustees to develop a scoring rubric to evaluate the applications. Obvious goals of the scoring rubric are similar to the HP grants to provide transparency to applicants so they know how they're being evaluated, clarity to the committee so that we can do our very best to be consistent and evaluate all of these applications uh, the same and to ensure equity in the review process. So by way of background, if we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. The committee discussed a 2022 proposed rubric at its November 13th and December uh, first meetings. They were quite robust discussions. We started with a fairly rough draft of a potential proposed rubric and work from there. Um, we got feedback from the committee on the November 13th meeting, um, including a, a suggestion that we really liked from Justice Murray to include a component for innovation because one of the things about partnership grants is they can be quite creative and they can um, come up with new ways to reach people and to allow people to have access to the courts. So uh, we, got, we got a lot of that feedback and that feedback was merged into a memo uh, dated December 1st, 2020, that was written by Crystal as a beautiful memo and that uh, it is attached to, the, uh, to your meeting materials uh, today. Um, the memo also outlines the rubric's purpose, the research, the substantial research that staff did, and more detailed information regarding this, the evaluation section. So we're going to summarize those for you today, but if you really want to get into the meat of what is being proposed, it's all in that memo. Three committee members are currently test driving the rubric. What we did is pull uh, a few uh, existing proposals from the 
prior year, the, the ones that we just approved, and we want to put them through this rubric to, to make sure that the numerical score that comes out is reasonable and relatively consistent to, to the decisions that we made. Um, very good, next slide. This is a very high level review of the proposed rubric. So it's four sections. The very first part above the dotted line is a checklist, are they even eligible? So this is, well, if they don't meet the eligibility requirements, we, we can't go any further. So that one's a yes, no. But then after that, it is largely discretionary. And so we have three basic large categories, uh, 80 points, 20 points, and then an extra 15 points that's optional, as I mentioned, for innovation. So as I said, if you, if you wanna see more detail about how these are broken out into subcategories, it's all in the December 1st memo that uh, Crystal wrote. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one of the feedback points we got from the November 13th meeting is that the rubric should have definitions to assist committee members during their review. So most of these um, broad categories and the subcategories, we have choices, exceed, meets, or below expectations, and then they're scored and weighted. So we did our best to come up with definitions that would be helpful and, and would uh, enable the committee to treat the applications consistently. And there are further definitions as set forth in the memorandum. Are there any questions so far? Okay, uh, next slide then, please. I raised a question, I, oh. I put it on the chat. How do, you, how do you propose to measure innovation? I have a definition here, let me find out. Uh, Christina, I could speak a little bit to that. Um, Herman, that's a great that's a great question. So, if if our proposal, uh, if the proposed recommendation is approved today, uh, what we are planning on doing is having an ad hoc meeting to kind of discuss innovation more in depth. We we do understand it is subjective, and um, Bonnie provided some great examples of some um, former uh, projects or current projects that had some innovation elements, and then maybe some um, categories. So it would be. We would try to provide some examples and then um, along with the RFP to be reflected in that. Um, I think we've discussed this in length during our partnership grant committee meeting innovation is subjective. Like is, is there a technology component? Are they trying something else in terms of collaborations um, and um, inter integration with existing services? Um, it's, it's just a very broad, this broad conversation to have that we haven't quite tied down at this point. So you're asking us to vote on this without having a clear definition of innovation? Yes. The, the proposal is going to be to allow, to delegate authority to the Partnership Grants Committee to finalize the rubric. None of this is a, a change from existing policies that the Partnership Grants Committee has used. We have just tried to put it into the rubric um, without changing anything existing. So, um, we are asking the commission to allow the partnership grants committee to finalize this rubric that we're presenting in concept. We've tried to be as detailed as we could in the crunched time frame, but we want to finish the the, the test drive um, with the, with the sampling of projects and fill in any any definitions, et cetera, that might be able to be tightened up. Hey, Christina, can I make a comment to, in response yeah. to Herman? Yeah. So. You know, one of the things over the many years of the partnership grants uh, committee that has come up is that by definition, the partnership grants, when they begin, they are supposed to be innovative. So, and, and Bonnie, you can certainly, I'm sure, weigh in with your experience on this, but th this, this money was always intended to be seed funding for a new program that would, over time, diminish our role in funding the program would diminish. And what we've discovered, you know, in a variety of different contexts is that some programs are just never going to get additional funding based on the nature of the services that are being provided or based on the location of the services. Senior uh, services in Yolo County is just not really ripe for foundation funding or local support and, 
And so we'll, what I think we've discovered, Herman, is that um, some programs and some ideas are more innovative than others. Can you and provide so, an example of what you've experienced in the past that was innovative? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, there are, there are I'm, I'm, the, boy, the committee can probably identify several, but for example, in Marin County, um, there's a, a, a sort of a mobile court, for example. So the Marin County Superior Court actually will hold uh, hearings outside of the courthouse and Legal Aid of Marin was participating in this sort of project to move cases through a, uh, through a mobile court um, location. And they used a partnership grant to do that. I'm not aware that that had been done elsewhere, but that's an example of innovation. And I think it would have been a way by having that, uh, by having that added to the rubric, it, it allows you to distinguish a program like that from one that while worthy might just be sort of an, another year of an existing program. So it sounds like a lot of this will just be subjective. Oh, I, I mean, <laughs> as, you, as you know, like, yes, I would say it's up to the committee to sort of make that determination, but hopefully identifying this is um, an attempt to sort of shrink where the subjectivity lies and sort of what the extent of the subjectivity would be. So what may seem innovative to me as a reviewer may not be seen innovative to you as a reviewer. There is no hard criteria as to what innovative is. Well, I mean, there's a definition in the dictionary of innovation. And I guess you could say that any program that's new is by definition more innovative than a program that is merely replicating that which has come before it. But I mean, sure, I think as with any grant making, right, there's gonna be discussion and disagreement and ultimately a measure of subjectivity that's applied to any grant. And ultimately a measure of agreement. I mean, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll exchange ideas and we'll collaborate and, and come to an agreement as to whether we think projects are worthy of innovation points or not. That's but the way it works for all these. Yeah, but the partnership grants have, you know, there are innovative ideas. I, I don't want to diminish that, but, you know, we've been trying to encourage them to think creatively in partnership with the courts. And we hope this is sort of an input that helps them do that. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I just had a, a comment. Um, I was the holdout on the partnership grants committee on on uh, recommending this. Um, I do think the the rubric is an improvement in some respects, having gone through the process this past year. Uh, but I think uh, it doesn't have the connections to the allocation process that was really difficult last year that I would like to see. And I'm concerned that if we adopt it, we will spend more time trying to calibrate the rubric, tweak the numbers, and to make sense within the, the context and the framework that we have than we would just discussing how are we gonna allocate the funds um, within the priorities as we understand them. And I just don't think we're there with this rubric. And I, I don't, my understanding is we cannot make significant changes to it. And so I am uh, opposed to its adoption at this time. Thank you. I, I'd like to ask Will to clarify because the motion is to approve the concepts as opposed to the finalization. So what you're saying is you have an issue with the concept? I just wanted my, to clarify that. Yeah, my understanding is uh, the, the concept included the, the framework as it's been 
as it exists, as it's been displayed to us. And we would not be able to make uh, changes to the definitions or clarity or eliminating a column or, or that sort of thing. And so maybe that understanding is, ac is inaccurate, but if that is accurate, then that is why in concept, I disapprove. Okay, I appreciate that. Could we get clarification? Sure, so in terms of adopting the rubric and concept, that was, uh, we, I don't believe we're stuck to the current like format. I think it's it's if there's any substantive changes that require a change in the rules or existing policies, that is, those are the restrictions we have to work within. If there's a column description or definitions that need to be added for clarity, um, that was within, I believe, if if delegated authority within the committee's discretion to make. So if it's as long as it doesn't raise the level of having to go through the codification process or introducing things outside of the policy or existing processes, um, there there is some flexibility to change to, to change it. I believe during the December 1st meeting, some of the changes proposed sounded like a rework of the whole thing, um, which which kind of um, which kind of flag that those could potentially be substantive changes again, requiring um, committee commission approval at that point. So, and if I can also add that um, any policy changes must not only have committee and commission approval, but must also have board of trustee approval. And the plan is that all of our discretionary grant rubrics be looked at together later on during the rules codification process. And so we want, um, because the Board of Trustees has directed uh, rubrics be utilized for our discretionary grants, um, they uh, requested that in 2019. Uh, we are trying to, um, you know, meet, meet the request of our Board of Trustees while also uh, providing a framework uh, for commissioners to review the discretionary grants and transparency to our grantees in a very limited uh, uh, box here. Um, and so we are tr just trying to use the existing policies, maybe provide a little bit more clarity and put them into a form that is a rubric that we can then learn from and that will inform the codification process. I think Zahira had a comment as well. Thank you. Um, and thank you for, for this discussion. Um, you know, I, I would just um, echo some of the other kind of concerns that have been raised. Um, I think that in approving this in, in concept, it seems as if there'll be the application process and then there'll be the scoring rubric that helps to understand like how the application is going to be scored. And in terms of the transparency of being able to provide a scoring rubric that um, just gives people a lot of information about what they're go what's going to be weighted and like what's going to be prioritized within the application. I just want I wonder if this um, has enough detail to it. Um, and because of how it's broken up, um, I, I raised the same concern that I raised before. Um, a lot of this is weighted, you know, 80 points. And I'm guessing that we're looking ultimately at a total of 100 because the other 15 are optional. Um, is just heavily weighted in one area. So I just I just wonder in terms of um, whether or not you'll, once you get the weights, and I understand that staff is reserving the um, ability to have that conversation later, but once you get the weights, if there'll be enough to kind of help with all the different weighting pieces. Um, and then with innovation, I do think that you need to define innovation for people um, in a very specific way so that they know exactly what is meant by innovation so that they can um, craft some information that helps them, helps it fit within that. And then also helps the reviewer understand what they're looking for with respect to innovation. Um, so I would just say that with this scoring rubric, um, it, it, it feels very, um, like I, I think seeing more, more there, like more opportunities for organizations to um, be able to shine and show their show their work. Thank you. Brady, you also had a comment. Um, uh, I was just gonna say also um, to keep in mind that the rubric um, is just a tool. And so obviously, you know, this is the first time it's being used. Um, if, if there's modifications on the back end that are needed um, during the approval and allocation process, 
that can be done. This is just a tool that we're going to be used. So I, I don't want people to think that they're, you know, completely married to the um, to the outcome of the of the rubric. Will, did we pick up your comment? I see you were in the chat as well. Yeah, I, I guess I made my comment already. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? I think Justice Murray raised his hand. Oh, okay, sorry. Go ahead, Justice Murray. So, I, you know, sort of the way that I look at this is that this is kind of a, a first step towards uh, crystallizing something that looks like this, but might look a little bit different in the future. Uh, this, is a, this is a far cry from our current way of evaluating, which is, I think, at least in my mind, a little bit more like doing it by feel as opposed to having specific criteria in mind as we look at each of the different proposals. So I don't know what other members of the partnership committee think, but in my mind, this is something that's gonna probably come back to the commission in the future um, <clears throat> for, to let you know about additional tweaking that, that might be uh, considered. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's kind of my view of it. It's, yeah, um, it's still a little bit of a work in progress. Is that an accurate way of, of looking at it? That, that's mm -hmm. my way of thinking on it anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mine as well. For sure. All right. Thank you. Are there any other comments? I just have a, a quick comment, Eric. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to step off of what um, Justice Murray was speaking about. This is not in any way, um, a divergent path than how we've always operated on the commission is to have the the subcommittee uh, be the ones who are delegated the authority to review and to uh, come up with recommendations and then bring it back to the full commission. Um, and I I read the resolution that this is approving in concept to give the to give the subcommittee the authority that we've always given the subcommittee. So I don't really see much here that's a, in controversy. Um, so if we're ready to uh, move and there aren't any discussions um, and you're uh, ready to entertain uh, this, Eric, I so move to approve. Second. Second. I, I have one clarification because I, I think that is helpful to hear. Um, but in looking at how the rubric was applied in the uh, homelessness prevention grants, for example, it seems like there would be a momentum towards using that point system to cut off the allocations. And it sounds like we could have the rubric, have the scoring, but we would be free to ignore those scores in deciding allocations. Is is that an accurate well, understanding no, or? No, I did. I, I... I wouldn't say that. I, I would say that ultimately we're guided by the, the um, you know, the, the, the statute and the rules. And if, if for some reason the, uh, the uh, rubric ended up creating a distortion, that could be correct, corrected. I, you know, I'm mindful of what I feel like staff communicated to us in the HP process, but also in the, in the, partnership grant process, which is that if a program were sitting there looking at your score on the rubric and they got six out of 10, you know, and they asked you, well, how do I get 10 out of 10? I mean, I don't think we want to be in the position of saying, you know, like Potter Stewart, you know, I know it when I see it, but I think, you know, we're like anytime you're using a scoring system, the goal is to sort of leave breadcrumbs to somebody to figure out how to improve what their score might be. So I, I'm, yeah. I think you trailed off Chris at the end. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I guess I, I find this to be a challenge with the rubric in general, because 
I just think it's in, it's inherent. It re remains subjective. The, there's sort of this, you know, attempt to make something quantifiable that's qualitative by definition. That's the restraint we're working under because we've been directed from on high to do this. So I, I just, you know, want to acknowledge that there's still a fair amount of discretion that goes into giving someone a six or a seven. You know, ultimately I agree with Brady that we, you know, when you, when you sort of line everything up, you still have to make decisions. And that might mean that, you know, a six should, should not be disqualifying or, a, you know, you have to make a late adjustment because you have a 360 degree view of the implications. So, I agree with Justice Murray that it's a work in progress, but I I have low hopes that it will ever be perfect. <laughs> and I don't think that we are, this body is looking for perfection. At least I don't hope that the commission members who are um, discussing this from a perspective of, of controversy are thinking that we're going to uh, meet perfection through the grant making process. But again, the, um, the motion is before us, I moved. And if there isn't any more discussions, I think Bob seconded, shall we move to uh, roll call vote, Eric? Thank you. Mm -hmm. unless, yeah, unless there are more comments, let's do it. Anishe? Yes. Eric? Yes. Amin? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Tim Bartleson, Luis, Pamela? Yes. Catherine? Yes. Will? Will, are you still there? I think he was frozen for a bit. Okay. Will, are you? Oh, I'm sorry. I was, I'm having internet problems, no but problem. no, thank you. Erica? Um, I just, before I vote, I'll just note that Corey oh. said that she had a question in the chat. Oh. So I don't know whether we want to address that or she wants to continue to, if she wants to make a comment or not, but. Uh, Corey, did you want to make a comment? Thank you, but that's okay. Oh, thank you. That's okay. Yeah, we can, we can just proceed with the vote. Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry I to raise that. I appreciate that. Erica. Sorry about that. Erica? Okay. Uh, I'll vote yes. Herman? I'm going to abstain. Rebecca? Yes. Corey? Yes. Zahira? Abstain. Jim? Yes. Deborah? Yes. Bob? Yes. Rich? Yes. Kim? Yes. Chris? Yes. Christina? Yes. Sixteen, um, Chris. I have sixteen as well. Okay, motion passes. Thank you. So let's move on to item six, the uh, grants administration. Uh, I'll briefly note that um, the executive committee um, met briefly last week for the first time, at least the first time that the four of us uh, were convened as a committee. Uh, we decided that we will meet quarterly before the uh, each quarterly commission meeting for the purpose of flagging items on the agenda, discussing uh, anything that we think needs to be discussed about those items uh, and anything else um, of importance. Um, it is, uh, and, and those meetings will be public just like other meetings of the commission. And last week's meeting was, was public as well. Um, we would urge everyone to, uh, for all meetings of the commission and meetings of committees, uh, to remind everyone that it's important to RSVP to Vicki and Kim so that we know that there will be a quorum at the meetings. Um, it's very important that you do that. And we hope that everyone has received their Outlook calendar invites for both the commission meetings and whatever, whatever meeting, that you're, whatever committee that you're serving on. Um, uh, we did not make any decisions at last week's meeting other than to we briefly discussed the, uh, the um, item on the agenda that uh, had a lot of discussion today, the uh, possible change, the indigency standard. Um, 
And that Bonifche or Rich or Kim, do you want to add anything to to that? No, I think you covered everything. Agreed. Can I just make a comment regarding the executive committee? As I said before that, I hope in the next time that this is done that if, if there are people who the commission feel are qualified who are not lawyers to be on this committee, to be on the executive committee, that should be considered that I think at least in my interpretation that those of us who aren't lawyers are on this commission to provide uh, our opinions. And if the executive committee is going to be made up of only lawyers, then I ask are our opinions valued or respected? And I would just hope that in the process, because at least it's my understanding that this decision as to who would be on the executive committee was made not with any consultation with the overall commission. And if that was done, and I apologize that I, may, I wasn't part of that, I wasn't there, but I think it should be something that should be brought back to the um, total commission just so that there is representation. Yeah, thank you, Herman. That's, uh, that's a good contribution. And, and can I follow up on that just briefly? Sure. Just, um, I uh, was unclear on the, the process and procedure here, usually I'm, I understand that uh, the larger body creates the smaller body, a committee through a motion and an action to define the purpose and scope of that committee's authority. And that doesn't seem to be the case here. And I just didn't understand uh, why it didn't work that way or how it was supposed to work procedurally. I can speak to that briefly. Maybe um, Brady can can elaborate. Um, the, the the appointments for officers as well as um, new commissioners um, is uh, it was changed a couple of years ago and it's centralized now. It's um, the appointments liaisons, which are um, two liaisons that's part of the board of trustees, uh, make a recommendation um, to the board of trustees for approval of officer positions um, as well as um, new commissioners. Um, Brady, do, you, do you, I don't know if you want to elaborate or have anything else to add? Uh, no, you said it perfectly. Yeah, I understood that they are all officers, and of course they can can meet to uh, discuss their officer duties. It, it just seemed like an executive committee was a separate entity from the creation of the officer positions and fulfilling the, those roles. So that's where I was confused and just didn't understand procedurally how that happened. I mean, Duan, to, to follow up, you, you, the, the executive committee was already created. I think it's the clearest, simplest answer. Mm -hmm. Just like there's um, a bank grant committee and every year, um, you know, some, some folks may um, be stepping down and we have new people that, that that committee already was in existence. Oh, I just, I didn't know that. Okay. If there's any <laughs> documentation you can send to me, I would greatly appreciate yeah, it. So I understood it better. That committee last year was um, when Eric and Bonache um, were chair and vice chair, um, was a committee of two and now it's a committee of four. Um, but the committee has been in existence, you know, as far as I remember. Um, I know there are people that are on this commission longer than I've been part of staff, but um, my understanding is that that committee has always been in existence. That's yeah, my Will, it's, it's always been a committee of four. Uh, we became a committee of two just last year. But it's always been for for as long as the 11 years I've been on the commission, it's always been a committee of four. And that's the that's just been the like, as as Dwan said, it's just people that, you know, are smarter than me and been around <laughs> longer than me thought that up for the commission as a way in which to do the work um, and it'd be the most effective. Uh, Rich, you were going to say something. Just to confirm what you were just saying. Thank you. I, I wasn't around that long, so I, I was not here when it was four. I was only here when it was two. So I appreciate the clarification there. And 
if we have documentation, I, I think don't, I don't know. I don't know if we do. I don't know if we do, Will. Um, Brady and I will probably look at the board book and to see if there's something. I know that in the board book, the Board of Trustees has a, a, a kind of a manual uh, where it talks about officer appointments. I'm not sure if it talks exa um, exactly about executive committee. We can look into that. I don't think what you're asking for exists, though. I, I was not aware if there is a rule about non lawyers serving on the executive committee or that being limited. No, there's way. not. There's not a limitation. There's not a limitation. Yeah, I, I think in the past, there has been sort of, shall we say, much more limited interest in taking on the role because of the additional work. But I think there had been an effort to sort of divide it between Northern and Southern California and to try to get at least some diversity of experience in terms of tenure on the commission and maybe professional background or whatever. Um, just in response to Herman's point, I I'm so grateful for the public members of the commission and in particular for the non-lawyer commissioner commissioners. Um, I think their perspective has just historically been extremely valuable, um, frankly, probably disproportionately valuable. Um, I feel very confident saying that. There are lots of lawyers, um, fewer public members. So I, I'm quite grateful for, you know, just the different perspective. Thanks, Chris. And any other comments on item 6A? Otherwise, we can move to the uh, 2021 work plan. Um, and let me share, um, I just had that one modification that we talked about from um, last time for the work plan. Let me share. It's included in your meeting materials. Um, can you see this? So this is all the same. Um, the only thing I added um, was this bullet point based on what we discussed last time. Um, so I attached it to um, this goal four that talks about the justice gap study. So based on recommendations from the justice gap study, um, research, um, uh, research and, oh, sorry, I think I'm missing a word there. So based on recommendations from the justice gap study, um, Oh, it, it probably should say the legal service trust, the commission will research and explore recruitment and retention strategies for legal aid attorneys, including the creation of a statewide um, loan repayment assistance program. So I hope I, and I can I'll modify that to uh, add the commission there. Um, does this address kind of the, what we discussed last time? Cause I know we wanted to add a bullet point to the work plan um, that was broadly speaking so that we can do some um, exploratory research this year. Um, I'm also pleased to um, report back to you that on the COAF side, um, uh, the COAF had a meeting last week um, where there was a, um, a, a, a presentation on the LRAP program that was really well received. Um, Elizabeth is in the process right now of coordinating um, a call between um, the leadership of COAF um, our, our commission, as well as the Access Commission, to kind of begin the preliminary discussions on this. Um, we have staff in our department um, that's geared up to do um, help with some um, preliminary research. So we're hoping to get the ball rolling on this fairly soon, um, based on our conversation and COAS conversation. So we're very, very excited about that. But I hope this captures everything that we discussed last time with that modification. Do we need a motion, Duan? Yes. Uh, well, we need a motion to approve the entire work plan um, because it will be presented um, to the Board of Trustees in one of their earlier meetings in 2021 for approval. So moved. I'll second. Great. Let me do roll call vote. Excuse me. Banashe Glagi? Yes. Eric Iskin? Yes. <clears throat> Amin? I mean, are you still there? Jeff? Yes. Kim Bartelson, Louise, Pamela? Yes. Catherine? Catherine Blakemore? Will? Yes. Erica Connolly? Yes. Herman? Yes. Rebecca? 
Yes. Corey? Yes. Zahira? Yes. Jim? Yes. Deborah? Yes. Bob? Yes. Rich? Yes. Kim Savage? Yes. Chris? Yes. Christina? Yes. Uh, Catherine Blakemore had, uh, I think she had gone off and come back on, so she was an attendee, but now she has the ability to speak. Okay. Uh, Catherine, would you like to um, vote to approve the, the work plan? Yes, I'm good. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Great. Thank you. So, Chris, I have 18. I have 18 as well. Okay. Motion passes. Uh, and has a quick comment. Yeah. Thank you. I, I just wanted to thank the, the staff team for going back and revisiting the work plan. And again, appreciate that there is a busy year ahead. Um, and thank you for incorporating the pieces related to the justice gap study. I very much appreciate it. Thank you. Of, of course. And, you know, we're so excited in the office um, to start this work. Um, we've been, the staff has been meeting and, and we think this is just a really um, kind of good, nice banner project to collaborate on um, and just see where, where it takes us. And, um, and, and, and we love the fact that we'll also be collaborating with the access commission on this. Um, so we will have a lot to report back next commission meeting. Juan, um, let's move on to our favorite subject, audit extension requests. Um, yes, let me uh, share my screen again. I apologize. You know what? I'm having a hard time pulling up my PowerPoint. It disappeared. So let me talk about it while... Um, Erica, Christine, can you pull up my PowerPoint and share it? Um, so we, we've been receiving um, questions from programs about um, audit extensions, how flexible um, the, the, the commission is going to be um, because programs are starting to engage with their auditors um, to do their, 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 their um, 2020 audit. Um, so I, I told them I bring it back for a point of discussion and perhaps um, I have a proposed motion, um, uh, you know, uh, to propose to you um, just to, to give pro programs some peace of mind. Um, they know that the audit um, is part of the application. And right now, um, the rule is that um, uh, the, the audit is due May 1st for all programs. Um, staff have authority to provide extensions up into the due date of the application. And the application for um, 2022 funding will be due uh, mid-May. Um, and after the application, um, the commission has authority to accept um, late audits and application under extraordinary circumstances. So I've provided this kind of draft motion um, and I'll, I'll just read it. Um, so due to the extraordinary challenges brought by um, COVID-19, the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission will be flexible in approving late audit and financial review requests. To be eligible for 2022 funding, the commission strongly encourages organizations to submit audits and reviews by the May 1st deadline. However, extension requests to May 31st will be approved on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I, I really strongly uh, suggest that we not move the application deadline like we did this year. I know um, obviously we're responding to emergency situation, but it really put, um, I think both staff and the commissioners are on eligibility and budget review in a very, very short um, expedited, too expedited of a time frame to review that. So our, our suggestion is to keep the application deadline firm. We'll be flexible with, with um, deadlines, but at least from the outset, um, providing this extra few weeks and then seeing how how great the, the request is and we, we may need to modify. But I think this motion will, um, will at least send the message that there's some flexibility without totally providing <laughs> unlimited flexibility because that would be hard for for both the commission and staff so Tuan, this is bob i've got a question on on the wording i want to make some suggestions of course okay on line three i'm uneasy it says flexible in approving late audit i want to suggest we consider flexible in considering late audit but more so it's the second and third last lines that to me have two different possibilities of meeting. The review by May 1st deadline, however, extension request to May 31, 21. I don't know if that means you have to get the extension request in by May 31, or you have to have the 
delayed audit in by 31 May. I, I think there needs to be better wording about extension requests to May 31 needs to be clarified, modified. And, and I want to suggest instead of third line approving, the third, it be a verb considering because approving locks us in. Okay, so with the with the first with your first comment, um, changing the approving to considering, um, Brady, th there's not a problem with that, right? Because I ran this motion by Brady. Uh, I think that that should be fine, right, Brady? That's an easy. Brady, Sorry, Brady, are you still there? Sorry, Sorry muting problems. Um, yes, I think yeah. that, that would be fine. Uh, I think. I think. Can, can we change that in live? Um, whoever's running the slide right now. Thank you. So, Duan, the uh, the other uh, suggestion that Bob made maybe could be met by uh, saying, instead of saying, however, extension requests to May 31, maybe you could say, however, requests to submit audits on or before May 31, something like that. I, I think that could do the trick. Um, and maybe we shouldn't have, maybe I shouldn't have connected it with that. that maybe it should just be two sentences. Um, is that yes. the confusion too? Can we just yeah, read right there? Thank you. And and so, the reason why I wanted to have include um, to really have them um, try to submit by May first because if everybody goes and requests a deadline uh, extension till May thirty first, again it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna cut out two period uh, two weeks for us in review, and that would be really hard for us. Wanted sure. to say, you say request to submit. <laughs> Audit extension requests must be submitted by 31 May. Not the request. Something. It's not the request. It's actually the audit to be submitted. It's not okay. just the request. Then, it's then audits, you know, delayed audits still must be submitted by 31 however, May. However, how about however um audits take out, take out the word take out the word extension, just requests to submit yeah, audit. Audits are financial reviews. Yeah. So, so Dwan, it's Catherine. Yes, Catherine. So this seems like the current rule that we're now passing a resolution about, and I'm trying to understand why. You said you gave program the guidance as to what the rule was. No, well, so the rule, the rule, the rule as as it's right now, the state bar rule is that May May first is is when um, the audits have to begin. Audits and financial reviews. They can submit a request for staff approval up until the date of the application is due, which is May thirty first, right? Well, no, the application is due middle of May, May fourteenth. So your extent. So the difference is you're extending it by two weeks. We're extending it by two weeks, and you would, in a, you, you would say that you're providing that because what what happens practically right now is that um, staff approves up until May fourteenth, th uh, and if it comes in through at you know May twentieth, we have to elevate it officially to the the commission. They don't have assurance, and they're very nervous right now that you may not approve their their late audits, even though it, I, I'm, you know, it's hard for me to say I, I'm, you know, I'm confident they will. That's why we would like some type of motion to, to, to give. But, but here it still says you're not really giving them till May 31st because you're going to prove it on a case by case basis, right? Yeah. So I, yeah. I, I mean, we hedged a little bit. So I, I guess we could take that out in case. The, the, the problem is we're trying to have an in, a little bit of an injury between because I think we are a little bit concerned that, and I don't think this is a real concern, but there is a potential mm -hmm. that they would all come in after. We were so flexible last year that it um, it, it made it really hard for staff, and so we're we're, we're trying to get, get a gauge. If there are only a few that come in between the 14th and and the 31st, then we can handle that. But if it's an avalanche of them, it, it, it's then, very hard. Then I don't think this is a good idea because how would you decide if there was an avalanche? So you're going to decide well, it on a case by case basis in that two week period if there's well, an. Avalanche and that doesn't provide any assurance to either you or to the program. So I, I guess I like really just trying to make sure that this that this that we're passing actually has some meaning that can be relied upon both for the staff who have to do the work and the programs that may have a, a reason to submit it to submit it late. And I, I guess I'm just wondering if it isn't better that we stay with the original rule, which gives 
some authority for exigent circumstances, as I recall, I'm not looking at what the original words were that you used to approve it until that time, because otherwise I think, I think this is creating more confusion than you may be solving. Well, the, the language, and it doesn't have a lot of clarity, is extraordinary circumstances. It's only been tested now um, once or twice, I believe, and, and you accept an audit um, that was submitted late. I, you know, the, is there my only hesitation is, is not having something that they, um, they're really worried. And, and I do think like, if it is just a handful that you are going to approve. And so that would give programs peace of mind, some programs. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I was being overly cautious by saying case by case, and maybe we should just end it by um, request to submit audits and financial reviews on or um, before May 31st will be approved and not take out on a case by case basis. Well, I, I hedged it a little bit on I mean, that. Or, or put the standard in there so people know what it is, right? So the standard is whatever it was, exigent or whatever word you use will be approved on a in act you know for extraordinary circumstances or something because that's really what you're trying to get at that yeah. we're in an unusual time and people need to know there's flexibility if something mm -hmm. extraordinary happens but it yeah. shouldn't be everybody having an extraordinary circumstance because that's not likely mm -hmm. so that i mean i feel like the standard that at least says what the standard is so people know what they're up against is is better how about this? However, requests um, due to extraordinary. Actually, Duan, before you move on, Erica has been trying to get in. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, Erica. Well, it's hard. I can't see people. Sorry. Thanks. Thanks, Monaje. Um, I guess, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm sort of aligned with, with Catherine on this. I guess the, the sort of two questions I have is what is the feedback we're getting from the, the various organizations about why they don't think they can get their Audits it's it's, it's COVID-19 related because audits are taking longer to conduct, um, do, uh, being done remotely. I mean, I'll use the state bar as an example. Ours is taking mm -hmm. um, like double the time, if not more, to conduct. The, the, this is the same thing that's happening. So they're getting estimates from their auditors that are um, longer than what they had um, planned for in previous years. Okay. Um, but I think I, I'll just say like, I sort of agree with with Catherine, which is if, if we're not going to sort of be prepared for everybody to go until May 31st, you know, then why not just leave, leave it as is, which is, you know, we, we, it's May 1st, unless there's extraordinary circumstances and, you know, COVID-19 might be an extraordinary circumstance. If your auditor tells you, you can't make it, it's fine. But like, it just feels like, what are we, what are we filtering out by doing this this way? Well, and what can we, what can you just remind us what we did over the past year? We were very flexible this past right. year to the point of um, being, um, you know, to put it bluntly, um, it, it made it really hard for staff. I mean, we're, we cut out four to five weeks of review because we're so flexible on application and audits that um, the staff was staying up um, for working seven days a week for-, for right. And what did we, and what was communicated to the programs about in advance about flexibility or no flexibility. I mean, I understand the need to kind of have some sort of structure in mm -hmm. dealing with exigent circumstances as we are doing with other areas that we, we that we somewhat govern. But um, I also get what, what Catherine's saying and she's kind of being protective for everyone, which I think is a good thing. But I mean, I'm just, no, not trying to recall exactly what happened. So we were we were we were we were pretty flexible across the board. Is right. To be honest, not only did we um, move back the application due date a month to give them a month right. to submit audits and applications, but then I don't know on the back end if you'll recall um, there were um, I, I think we half, had half a dozen a dozen programs that had um, audits that were trickling in over the, the course of the next six weeks that made it very very difficult for us. And then there were the two programs that. Um, went into August, September, I believe. Yeah. And so Zahira, you had a comment as well. I do, thank you. Um, just to add in terms of some of the complications as to why some of the organizations are a, a little late in terms of their auditing um, is that um, as Delon mentioned, there is sort of the backlog in terms of the auditors. There is the fact that the documents that are needed are 
in the office. And so there's an issue of having to go to the office to access those files and auditors don't need to be on site the same length of time that they were before, but they may have to have some time on site. But then the other thing that happens is that um, the organizations that we're speaking of are nonprofits. And so they end up being at the bottom of the list for a lot of auditors. Um, so there are organizations that they have a time period in which they have to get their 990 in. So their 990s are in um, and their audits are just incredibly delayed because the auditors um, are delayed with everything else. And for next year, I don't know what it will look like. They'll, there are already the notes that are rolling out because of COVID. There are organizations that have the reconciliation of the PPP loan, which currently sits on their books as a liability and whether or not that has been like gone through the process, there may be some you know additional delay due to that. But I do, um, think that we, we it's, it's a potential that we'll see the same level of delays that we saw this year um, because a lot of issues still haven't been resolved um, and nonprofits do end up being kind of a lower priority in some ways for, for auditors. Hey, Erica? <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, maybe the way to, to revise this is to say that we will consider like exigencies from COVID-19 to, to meet the extraordinary circumstances standard. And then so that we, you know, we, we can give them that comfort, which is, you know, we understand this is like a big problem. And so in those circumstances, you know, if, if you're going to have a, if, if your delay is COVID-19 related, given to like, you know, what, I mean, I think Sahara's points are really well taken. Um, like we, we will look on that very flexibly um, without, you know, and so they have to kind of explain to us that that's the situation and that we're not gonna just kind of broadly allow, you know, um, an extension to the May, to May 31st. Does that make sense? Kind of restructuring the motion that way? It does, but I, I, as a practical matter, if I were a program, I would read this as an extension till May 31st, frankly, I mean. Well, but don't you think you they would have, I mean, I think we would say like, you know, you have to show us something that says it's, it's COVID-19 related, right? <laughs> like yeah. the auditor said they couldn't do it on time, something like that, right? I mean, maybe I'm, maybe I'm making a distinction without a difference, but. I you know, wonder, I, I wonder, and you know, and I'm, I'm saying this while, uh, you know, I have a, a strong bias towards staff and protecting staff and their time and their lives and the amount of hours that they devote to this work. Um, but I wonder if, if there's a, you know, we could, we as commission members right here, right now, can make a very affirmative statement that we are not taking these extensions lightly. And that maybe there's a way in which, as we've we've been able to um, announce in the past through Selena and you know meetings like this, to make that point clear to the programs. Um, I just my concern is is that if we uh, pass this, are we going to need to come back and? you know, pass another motion when COVID-19 is not in our lives, God willing, soon. So I'm wondering, you know, going back to Catherine's point, are we um, overthinking this or are we pushing ourselves into a corner with this potentially? And could we support staff by making a very strong statement regarding these requests for extensions? Are you suggesting that, what are you suggesting that we do not put in this language and just stick with the current May 1 and consider requests on a case by case basis, communicate to the programs informally that if they have a real COVID related issue, we'll, we'll consider it, but the deadline is May 1? Yes. I think that might be a little bit harsh um, given that the pandemic and COVID-19 um, that you know, but of course we would we would as we have we will take whatever evidence they have and we'll take their their uh, reasoning under under consideration. But I think 
if we can, and you know, and programs are good in, they've at least thus far have, have been able to prove that they hear us when we make these kinds of statements. And Selena has been great in helping in being able to, um, you know, disperse this, this, these types of statements. So I, I just wonder if we, we might be, um, you know, as I said, we might be overthinking it with this. But I, I think that, you know, practically speaking though, that, that, and I appreciate, you know, all the commissioners looking out for staff, but that it might create more work for staff in terms of, um, if I may make a suggestion that maybe we add in that language um, of extraordinary circumstances and, and, and just um, end it there, um, just to give them some peace of mind, because I don't know how to stress to you that there, there is a lot of anxiety because the um, audit is tied to the application that they won't be approved for funding. So that gives them a little bit, it's a, a bit of a, a, a midway and, you know, I, I hedge by putting in the case by case, but then we will provide the extension till May 31st. Go on, I have a question. If we approve this resolution and somebody submits, a bunch of them submit their requests on May 15th or May 20th and they get, they get staff approval, is the commission gonna then have to approve that? Or can we just get, are we giving staff authority to, to approve extensions till May 31st? Brady, can we can we modify um, to give staff extension? Is that a possibility given that the state bar rule says that staff only has authority until application? Brady, are you there? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I, I mean, the committee can delegate its own authority. If, if that's, so yeah. So Brady, that's because the rule was created by the commission and the commission therefore can delegate its authority to staff. Is that what you're saying? It's Catherine speaking. The, the, it's a state bar rule, but the commission can always delegate authority, right, Brady? Yes. Uh, have you been hearing me? No, I didn't hear you. Oh. No. <laughs> uh, yes, I said, I said yes. Yes, yes. The commission could delegate that authority. Well, I so think, I think that the, makes sense because trying to get the commission then to approve these is just going to delay things further, most likely. So that makes sense as a helpful. Yeah. Would you? To staff yeah. To yeah. If you would feel comfortable delegating that authority to staff, then um, we're we're happy to take that on, on that responsibility. Until the, the, the May 31st deadline. Um, and then we'll report back to eligibility and budget review if, it, if it's beyond that deadline and it gets to a point where it is unfeasible for us. So the point of this resolution will be for the commission to grant authority to staff to extend the audit deadline as deemed necessary by staff. Yeah, yeah Brady, could you help me wordsmith it really quick? Um, so it would just for I thought it was kind of COVID related extraordinary reasons or sorry, extraordinary yeah. COVID related reasons. So the staff has the authority to extend the deadline until May 31st for well, can we just modify the last line then to say that? Yeah. I was I, yeah. however yeah. um staff may has the authority, yeah, right there. Yeah, I, you know, staff has delegated authority to to approve, staff has the delegated authority. No, no, staff has delegated authority uh, to consider and approve in whatever whatever you want to delegate. Consider and approve um, a, a financial review and audit requests um, related. Um, well, we need to tuck in the extraordinary um, circumstances, Brady, because yeah. that's the standard. True. Um, mm. So top. COVID related or extraordinary COVID related sure. extensions for submission on or before May 31st. Yep. Perfect. Sorry, can you say that one more? Okay. However, staff has delegated authority to consider and approve audits and financial reviews for COVID related extensions.
on or before and just have a period at the um, at the end of 2021 to take out. Yeah, thank you. You know, that, that wording looks a little awkward to me. It is, it's just mm -hmm. an audit review. So how about, how about this? However, comma, for COVID-19 related extensions, staff has delegated authority to consider and approve audits. It's, it's so, true, we still didn't get the However, for COVID related reasons, staff is delegated authority to consider and approve, et cetera. Ex extensions. Um, if we wait, if until, we limit it to COVID, I'm sorry. If we limit it to COVID, what if their building burns down? Yeah. Well, that's you know, the other standard. That's, we have another standard, Bob. That's the extraordinary. Yeah, okay. Standard. That's what stands. This is just really COVID related. Well, given Thank that you. information, then should we just define anything COVID related as an extraordinary yeah. standard? I think we're just saying right here, it's just gonna be COVID related, which I think is fine given that yeah, there's a I think, standard, but I think extensions is in the wrong place. Right. COVID related re reasons, comma, staff has delegated authority to consider and approve audit and fiscal review extensions. Right. Yep. Extensions, right, yep. Through. Through, it should say through May 31st, because on or before yep. is clear if yeah. it's. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, through, yeah. Until maybe, until through, whatever. Through, yeah, through is fine. Okay. Through no later than, let's speak, yeah, through no later than May 31st, I would say. <laughs> Should the word review be singular instead of plural? Well, either audits, oh, yeah. singular for both or plural for both, I guess. Yeah. Plural for both. Plural for both, yeah. yeah. Okay. With, with with the May thirty first, twenty twenty one, we're assuming that COVID nineteen will be Wait, done, no. done away with. No. Or so after so if it's there after next year, do we have to re review this? Yes. Or make another yeah. resolution. We'll, we'll have to re review because okay. I mean we'll, we're keeping an eye on things and as things unfold, um, we'll we'll report back out to the eligibility and budget review committee. Okay. All so right. Dwan, if the building burns down using Bob's hypothetical and they it's, want to submit by May 20th, we'll have to have a separate commission. It's a separate, that's a separate, yeah, separate uh, that'll go through regular course process with the, the standing state bar rule. So I, I have one more edit that I would make there at the end. I would remove extensions through. It should say delegated authority to consider and approve audits and financial reviews through. no later than May 31st, 2021. Maybe it's submissions. Submitted. No later Submitted. Submissions, yeah. I think. They have to do something. Yeah, yeah. To review COVID. Ex extensions does not belong. <laughs> What, yeah. But wait, 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 wait. What we're approving is no not. Later we're than not. May 31. Excuse me. We're not. We're not approving the actual audits. We're approving the extension request. So it should be. I think it should be staff has delegated authority to consider and approve requests for extension. Um, to submit audits. Of, of, uh, to, to submit audits and financials um, yes. reviews um, through no later than May 31st. We're, we're oh, all we clear the words are the, the submission of that document has to occur by May 31st, not the extension request, right? Yes. Yes. Yep. Is that what that language now says to everyone? Submitted. Approve request for extension. I think you have. Extensions for <laughs> sub, uh, of the deadline for submitting. Yes. Have the deadline for submitting until That's no later than May thirty first. This is how the Declaration of Independence was drafted. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the new thing they got it done. Thank you. <laughs> Correct. Okay. But they didn't have they didn't have Zoom and you know <laughs> uh, all look at the document at the same time. It was clearly lower stakes. 
<laughs> okay. okay. I read it through. I'm good with it. Me too. All right. I'll make a motion to approve the resolution as drafted on the screen. Catherine okay. Simmons. Okay. I'll do roll call. Um, Bonachet? She had to leave. Okay. Thank you. Eric? Yes. Amin? Amin? Jeff? Yes. Kim Bartleson? Louise? Pamela? I approve the deadline to May 31, but not the extension. Um, it's either yes or no. No. Or abstain. Abstain. Uh, Catherine? Yes. Will? Yes. Erica? Yes. Herman? Yes. Rebecca? Yes. Corey? Corey, are you still there? Zahira? Yes. Jim? Yes. Deborah? Yes. Bob? Yes. Rich? Yes. Kim? Yes. Chris? Yes. Christina? Yes. I have 15, Chris. I have 15, too. Okay, motion passes. All right, so okay. we didn't have enough to do. Um, we have another RFP to be working on in 2021. So, Duan, you want to, whoever. Uh, yeah, Chris, have... Christine, can you run the slides for me? Um, I just, just bear with us. This is going to be really quick. <clears throat> Uh, so last time um, we talked about, um, there was a bullet point added to the work plan last year. Um, I mean, sorry, at the last meeting. Um, it's just the last two slides, Christine, all the way at the bottom. Oh, sorry, go up one more after. Go back three slides. That one, yep. Um, so we, we talked about this um, at the last um, commission meeting. Um, uh, AB uh, 3362 um, was amended a few months ago to increase the opt-out donation. Um, currently it's $40 and that goes to the Justice Gap Fund, which, which then gets pooled and um, uh, distributed as IOLTA um, grants. There's an additional $5 now that's um, um, amended um, from, from the statute um, to provide funding for um, provisional license attorneys. Um, this is going to apply for the 2021 and 2022 annual licensing fee um, bit, um, dues. Um, next slide, please. And I included a, a, a copy of the legislation um, in, in your meeting materials. Um, it, it's, it, there's only a paragraph. It doesn't give a lot of um, kind of guidance. Um, the, the first, um, I lifted that language from that first um, box there. Um, it, the 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 five dollars needs to go um, out through a competitive grant process um, to IOLTA funded organizations. These are our QSPs and um, support centers to hire law school graduates with the temporary um, provisional licensees. Um, so we don't know how much money will become from this, but Donna and I did some quick um, kind of back of the napkin math, and we think it might be able to fund um, three um, to five provisional licensees. So we're not anticipating a large amount of money from from the five dollar opt out. Um, it's hard to know until um, the, the the fee statements are collected and there um, as, as many of you know um, the the, uh, the uh, fee bills were sent out and they'll be due um, early February so we will be working with um, the department um, with the office at the state bar um, that collects those um, to keep uh, to get, get a better estimate of how much is coming in um, we're trying to move pretty quickly um, to distribute the fundings because um, as you all know um, the provisional licensees um, are a bit anxious for funding and we We've been getting fielding questions. Andrea's um, received a number of questions from um, programs and law schools. And, and so we're starting to get the trickle of, of questions. Um, and if we have the funding, um, it, it would be a service to the community to move quickly. Um, so because of that, um, we are we have made a, a, a proposal on the next slide, the resolution, um, to delegate authority um, to staff 
to work in consultation with the executive committee to develop um, a grant application and selection criteria, and also um, to to um, uh, to uh, select the awards themselves. Um, because these are all kind of estimates in terms of three to five, and that we don't anticipate a high, um, a large amount of funding. Um, if, if the situation does change, um, as you'll see in the motion, um, we do have language um, that the executive committee um, may come back to the commission um, to, 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 to suggest a different approach. But because we don't think it's a high volume of, of funding, um, we would like um, delegated authority to staff and executive committee. This is Andrea here. Thanks, Dwan. I just wanted to quickly chime in to mention that we are trying to manage expectations. So um, I sp spoke at the law school assembly, so statewide gathering of law schools last week to just note the funding levels um, that we anticipate. Um, obviously, we wish it was a lot bigger um, and whatever we can do is good, but we're, we are trying to communicate about um, this not being this huge new sea of funding to cover a, a really large number of people. And what we're imagining is a really pared down application. Um, it's the, the organization that applies and not the, the licensees themselves. Um, so, uh, you know, there are there are alter programs. So really a pared down application with, you know, why uh, maybe attach the, 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 um, the resume of, of the person that they want to hire. Um, but we'll have to really think about um, whether we want um, organizations to match funding or, or whether we're, we're trying to, uh, you know, pay for total costs. Um, so those are kind of some of the considerations, but um, oh, Herman is asking, what is the anticipated, uh, like I said, Donna did some um, some really a back of the napkin math and she thinks um, between three to five pills, but a lot of that is gonna also depend on, are we gonna fund and pay for benefits? Are we gonna pay for half and ask the organization to fund half? So there's some variables that, that we'll need to consider. And we haven't done, um, a deep dive analysis. We've literally looked at the legislation and now are trying to develop a plan. This legislation doesn't meet the Herman standard of legislative clarity. <laughs> it gives a lot of discretion, but it's not, a, it's, it's a, you know, it, it, it probably is not going to be a lot of funding unless we, we could be pleasantly surprised. And that's why there's language in there. Um, that, that, that it will net more than, than we, we think it will. Thanks for that shout out, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think will be the range of contributions? Well, it's, it's a $5 opt, it's a $5 opt in. Um, so it's not the range, it's whether they're gonna, you know, uh, affirmatively take it off the, the statement. So we don't know how many people will actually opt in to it. You must have a guess. <laughs> yeah, then that that's the guess that that's what Don was basing on and, and that's that's what we think based on that guess, the three to five. Is Erica, I just had a quick question on timing. You guys want us to delegate the authority. When are you expecting to um, have the applications out, get the approval and all we're, that? We're hoping to um, release applications the first quarter of next year. And then we haven't developed a timeline for then when they'll be um, due, when de award determinations will be made. We are at the infancy of, <laughs> of the um, process. But I assume you want the delegated authority so that uh, once the process moves, you don't need to keep coming back to yeah, us. Exactly. I, I, yeah, I think it's easier for us, um, you know, uh, to have, if you want, you know, to, to work with the executive committee because there's four of them and to notice a meeting and move quickly, it, it will help then to call try to have quorum for this body. Okay. That's all. In staff we trust. I'll make a motion to approve the resolution as adopted. Second. Thank you. Let me do roll call vote. Um, Bonache, Eric? Yes. Amin? Jeff? Yes. Kim? Bartleson? Luis? Pamela? Yes. Catherine? Yes. Will? I'll abstain on this one. Erica? Um, I'll say yes, but I'm laughing at Will. <laughs> Herman? Yes. Rebecca? Yes. Corey? Zahira? Yes. Jim? Yes. Deborah? Yes. Bob? Yes. Rich? Yes. Kim Savage? Yes. 
Chris? Yes. Christina? Yes. I have 15, Chris. I have 15 as well. Okay, great. Motion passes. Great. Thank you, everyone. Juan, when is our next meeting, next commission meeting? Um, it's February, and I can't remember the date off the top of my head. Okay, so everybody look at your calendars and please be responsive uh, to Vicki and RSCP for both the commission meetings and your committee meetings, as I said before. Uh, it's been a long day, a long agenda. Thanks everybody for participating. Um, unless there are further speeches, Bob, this would be your chance to give your famous adjournment. Okay, good night, Gracie, let's adjourn. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thanks, 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 Than